me suggesting that in fact, let me give you a, a technique that I use in selling that really blows people's minds because it's a stupid question. I ask a lot of ridiculous questions. If you ask enough ridiculous questions, you get some interesting answers. Very often, uh, you'll find someone who's unable to make a decision. You can do this in a court of law. You can do this in um, an encounter with your spouse. You can say, let's say you're not getting a decision out of the person, and they're, they're saying, I just, I can't see doing this with a kid. Sometimes I'll look at them and I'll say, how would you know if it were the right thing to do with a kid? What they'll do is they'll go through the eye accessing movements to tap into those parts of their brain that lets me know what the strategy is for making the decision. They'll go visual, constructive, which means they're, they're putting together a picture of how the kids would look. Then they'll go auditory, they'll talk to themselves about the picture. Yeah, that's the way I want it. Uh-huh. Then they'll go down very often to feel it. You know, how do I feel about that? Not everybody uses the same strategy. The number of strategies, you can multiply that out. It's a lot. It's six times five times four times on down the line. You can put together a number of combinations like that. But as soon as I find out, if I found out that was your strategy, visual, making a picture of the kids, how they want them to be, auditory talking to themselves, yeah, I think that's good, then the feeling, it feels right. When I talk to them, it would be something like that. You know, I really want you to see the children, get a clear insight into what they'll be doing, some perspective on it. And then, of course, you'll want to talk it over with yourself. You want to listen and make sure it sounds right to you so that you can know that it will feel proper, that you've got a firm grasp on what's going on. What have I done? I've structured my communication to their decision-making strategy. Isn't that another way of getting a report, a way of getting an step to their decision-making strategy? Now, if that sounds esoteric or unbelievable, I'll tell you people do this every day and even learn how to do it, too. And what we're going to do is this. I want you to pick a partner, someone you didn't come to. I'm going to turn your chair sideways. <laughs> you can put sound effects on, too. <laughs> and what I want you to do is go through. See, this is for a normally organized person who's right-handed. Now, normally means typically organized. It doesn't mean, you know, uh-oh, oh, wrong direction. This was not normal, Michael. Could he leave? You know, I don't want to know about that. Everybody, every you just find this is a normal trend. About 85% use these sources of cues to let you know which hemisphere of the brain they're, they're inputting into. Now, what I want you to do is get a partner and go through the questions that they've got here. Add a question like, for example, um, what color was your first car? <laughs> depending, depending on the person. Some people will stare out straight ahead and defocus their eyes. And for a time, if you're aware of it, you're not going to do it anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I'm done talking with you, you'll remember. <laughs> you know, if, if you're not getting a response, you know, that's, I understand, you know, I feel a little uncomfortable about that, too. And uh, I just wondered, you know, how will you do it? By the way, what color is your best trip? Oh, yeah. Great. Check it out. I think you'll be surprised. If you, you ever have teachers do this, don't look for the answer on the ceiling. You're not going to find it up there. <laughs> you ever have a teacher do that? What are you doing? You're trying to visualize what's going on. Do you know the best test-taking students are the swarmers? Do you remember the Quiz Kids show? How many of you remember that? How many old enough? Remember the kids? Right? They, you know, they do all these quizzes with kids, and the kids are squirmers that move around, their eyes go all over. What they were doing is tapping into different parts of their brain. They weren't just weird. They weren't fancy. That's a normal exaggeration of what went on. So what I'd like you to do is pick a partner, take a couple moments, and just ask them the questions down. Go, up, go from bottom to up. That's fine, too. If they don't map what, what's here, don't worry about it. Just remember what, they're, what they are. My brother's left-handed, so he's totally backwards. He's got a mirror image of this. If you're... If you're uh, ambidextrous, and I give my right arm to be ambidextrous. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty handy, huh? <laughs> it's, it's like those bullet trains they have in France, you know, 200 miles an hour, and you always tell the hobo. <laughs> 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 I was thinking, isn't that a weird thing to be thinking of? Hey, lefty. 
Yeah, hey. What do you do? I walk. I walk. <laughs> see how see how they react. And you can do this in conversation. You know, I just in the course of conversation say to somebody, you know, I had a conversation the other day. Make up the story. I had a conversation the other day with a friend of mine. And he told me he had the weirdest color for his car. It really puzzled me. What color was your first car? You know, hmm, or they'll go whatever direction it is. And then they'll tell you what it was. And you go, oh, that's interesting. What did it sound like? Say one of those big rrr rrr motors. They'll go to audit. You know, I wonder what it sounded like with a four cylinder instead of the eight. What do you think it would have sounded like? So make it up mm -hmm. how it would sound. You can check the right position. And then I'll show you how to use this in just a moment. Pick your partner. Don't wander out. I know your stomach's feeling a little queasy. Do you ever feel a little queasy when I say we're going to do an exercise? No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. It's all because you got a friend in the suite. I'm hallucinating again. Back to John Lloyd's tank. I'm floating. <laughs> all right. Turn your chair sideways. Pick a partner. If you don't have a partner, raise your hand and we'll get your partner. <laughs> Now, those of you scoffers, doubters, people, how many of you found that sort of an interesting thing that you have never thought of? I did too, I still do it. I, I had to convince my wife to this picture. She goes, Oh, that's bullshit. I said, All right, I'll see one. We'll do it with a friend of yours. We won't tell him. And she goes, How, how did you know that was going to work? I said, Let's try it with another friend. I started dragging people into her office at work <laughs> to a mechanic. <laughs> She's a service manager for a Hyundai dealership. You know that Korean car? You know, cars that make sense? Yeah. Cars that work. Okay, they were actually their nice little cars. Mitsubishi built motors. Cute. But after what they did to Alan Alden Nash, I'm not sure I could buy one. <laughs> now, let me ask you, how many have found that your partner generally follows a similar pattern to this? Now, how many found your partner did stuff a little differently? Good. Good. Because this is why persuasion is 90% uh, information gathering, 10% intervening. <laughs> 90% finding out what's going on out there, 10% doing something about it. Tell you a story about uh, Simon. A fellow named Charles Simon was an inventive genius. Worked for um, General Electric, as memory serves me. Simon retired. Was it General Electric? Does anybody remember? I hope I get the company right. I was keep screwing up at the Kettering working for four, and I'm sorry. Okay. Simons, uh, incidentally, under immigration laws in the U.S. today, Simons would not be allowed to immigrate because he's a hunchback. Yeah. What? Right, he's a hunchback. He's a hunchback now. And under present U.S. immigration laws, he would have stayed in Europe, and he wouldn't have done all the inventions that he did. What, what did he invent? Oh, Christ. Uh, okay. you, you can't name a major electrical component in use today that doesn't have two or three of his patents. He's responsible for about 85 different patents of improvements to electrical systems. Steinmetz retired, and they've got this huge turbine that is working and is generating a lot of power for a plant that Steinmetz had, had built. He's in retirement, kicking back, doing whatever. He did. And uh, he gets a call on the telephone. Uh, Mr. Steinmetz, we'd like you to come down and fix the turbine. He says, I'm retired. He says, you can build it. I goes, okay. He walks along the turbine, and this is a true story. If it weren't true, it should have been. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a true story in hope, if not in fact. He walked along the turbine, and the turbine was fully shut down. And he listened to it, and he walked around behind, knocked on it a little bit, listened to it, Walk all around the machine. And you know how when you're around a machine a lot, you know how you, you hear it when it sounds right if you've ever worked on a car motor? You know when it's got that real nice throttle. So yeah, this is really current. He said, uh, you got a hammer? One of the engineers said, sure, let's get it to me. I'm so hurting. Taps on it. And he reaches the hammer up and boom, and this sucker just starts right up. One tap. Thank you very much. He goes home and sends him a bill. 
thousand dollars. <laughs> She's gonna call me out of retirement. You're going to pay. <laughs> Natural General Electric is a rage. We want an itemized bill. Okay. One hammer tap. One hammer tap. Ten cents. Knowing where to tap. Nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars and ninety cents. <laughs> that is the value of information gathering. Now. You were gathering information about how your particular partner tapped into different parts of the screen. How when they're visualizing which part, which direction their eye goes. In fact, it's correlated. Everybody has eye movement that is connected with brain activity. Everybody has it. It's a little differently wired in each of us. That's why it's important to treat each person separately. You see, reality is very individualistic. It's not collective. It's not a matter of well, the average rule is this. <laughs> You're using the wrong eye accessing cues. Pull those eyes out. Wrong. <laughs> you got to be like a tailor. You have to take a fresh measure of each person you meet every time you meet. Now, let's say that you wanted to use this information. How might that be useful to you, do you think? Well, you can think of a couple ways. Knowing which representational system they're using, which sensory system they're using. How could you think that might be useful to you? <coughs> yeah? If you need something done quickly, and have to persuade something quickly to do it, or else the opposite leads off, just being able to see that, if you want to stand with one stroke instead of five, six times. All right. Yes? Might you, I'm asking, be able to tell if they're making it up? Interesting. Might you be able to tell if they're making it up? You remember how Nixon, when he was on TV, used to do this? <laughs> <laughs> What's the, no, I didn't say that because they can't catch me. The guys were killed anyhow. His eyes were shifty. That's where shifty eyes came from. Okay. Others, other ideas. How else might you do? You'd be able to uh, judge uh, in what uh, sensory area they're thinking. Okay. You can pick up very quickly which, which sensory uh, language I'd be talking. That's the most important part so that you can Build rapport in their sensory language. If they're talking visually and you're talking in sound terms, in auditory terms, they're not going to understand you. Now, but there's another area that I want to bring to your attention that might be very useful. And it's an area that is occurring to many of you, even as I speak about it. And that is high-level abstractions like truth, understanding, confusion, Creativity, wrong. I think it's morally wrong to allow pornography. Oh, really? Specifically, how do you know it's morally wrong? They have a right to their center of information. They have a right to whichever sensory field they're going to. If it's visual, it means they're picturing people doing carnal things. Film at 11. <laughs> <laughs> if it's auditory, it means they're hearing maybe mom and dad arguing about it. I know a lot of people that talk to themselves. I know you don't talk to yourself. You never listen to your head. Maybe have a friend. <laughs> and if you know that they're dealing in auditory systems, you can use that. Now, for example, somebody says, I understand you. You ever have anybody do that? You present a viewpoint and go, I understand. Try this. Here's a question I want to ask you. Specifically, how do you understand me? There's a right to the sensory field that's allowing them to understand. Now what do you do? You're going to start talking in their sensory language. If it's visual, you'll use visual terms. You'll use visual metaphors. If it's auditory, you'll stay with sound systems. If it's tactile, you'll say, I can see you're in the draft of this idea. It's not often you can put your finger right on the facts the way you did. And I really appreciate that. I can see that you've got this right in the palm of your hand. Now let's walk through this idea one more time and make sure that I've understood it the way you've understood it. You're going to communicate. You've got a report, don't you? And that sounds really simple. I'm not trying to convince you that it's true. You're going to convince you I'm not. And you know how you're going to do this. Of course you know how you're going to do it. You're going to do it with an experiment. But this experiment is not for this weekend. Or you can do it tonight if you want it to party. 
Catch someone who hasn't attended. This is always fun. Elevators is a great place to check this out. Try this in an elevator. This is a neat technique. Walk up to somebody and say, I met this guy down the street. They got this. I met a guy down the street. You know what he said to me? He said to me, what color is a red fire engine? <laughs> right? Their eyes are the right to visual. <laughs> Isn't that strange? I'd never ask anything like that and turn around. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very effective way of checking stuff out. If you don't want to, if you want to try some of this stuff out, how many of you would like to be able to try this stuff out and not get any heat for it, not feel embarrassed about it? Would you like that? Okay. Here's a technique, sneaky technique. I use it all the time. And then I find out some other people are using it and they've got their own little name for it. Not at all uncommon. They call it quotes. I used to call it faking. You make up a story. And then in the course of the story, you say something to someone that you want to say. I was walking down the street just a minute ago. This guy came up to me and said, bosses are jerks. Can you believe that? You walk off. Yeah, that's your boss. <laughs> no, you can't get any heat for it because you didn't say that. It's funny. You know, I have this friend who gave this workshop and he asked the craziest question. I remember the last day of the workshop, he came right up to me and he said, how would you know if you understood what life was all about? And watch your eye movement. It'll be very interesting because you'll understand what sensory information they're going to, which sensory language they're speaking inside their own head. Now, you can do a lot of things very freely if you use quotes. Quotes means, I don't do anything. I remember Milton Erickson. Any of you know who Milton Erickson is? Milton Erickson was the world's premier hypno hypnotic authority. He was a hypnotherapist. He did some of the most engaging work in the field. He's done volumes and volumes and volumes on hypnosis. Milt Erickson was a farm boy when he was a kid, had polio. He learned how people operated because he was stuck in his bed, and he'd have to, with very little evidence and very little ability to control his muscles, have to find ways of getting people to respond to him. But when all you got is a couple of words and you can barely talk, you learn to be very direct and develop a lot of leverage. Because if you don't, you spend a lot of time thinking and not interacting. Milton, fortunately, was able, as years go by, as years went by, to, to build uh, uh, the use of his legs and his arms and so on, and use crutches throughout his life. Anyway, Milton used to tell some outrageous stories. One day, one day Milton Erickson was having a conversation with Richard Bandler. And Bandler was disagreeing with Milton on something. He says, he says, you know, and I wouldn't say this to you, and I would know Richard wouldn't dream of saying it to you, and probably Milton wouldn't even say it to you, but Milton said it to Richard. He said, you ought to know this. You're going to pretend to be very persuasive with people. And you're going to pretend that you're effective at understanding people's sensory languages. And you're going to pretend that you're very effective at getting responses out of them that you want to get. Now, I'll know you're just pretending. And you'll know you're just pretending. But the people you talk to, they'll pretend it. They'll pretend to be persuaded. <laughs> but don't you be fooled because it's still all pretend. Now I can tell you that story. Who can tell me which of my characters told the story? Family. Nope. I told you the story about Bambler, who told you the story about Erickson, who told you the story. So I don't know who told the story, but I got away with it, and I don't have to explain it or justify it, because I didn't tell it to you. Try <laughs> <laughs> this. When you're, when you're a five-year-old kid, you tell me you haven't seen a five-year-old kid come in and do this. He's got a seven-year-old brother. Folks, says, this. Mommy, Billy said shit. <laughs> Billy, come here. <laughs> Billy got popped and the kids going, it's good to me. 
cross-dressing. So if you want a good technique, as a way of, if you want to try any of these things, whether it's political cross-dressing, using metaphors, or, or finding out how people, which sensory language they're using, let me recommend a to you. It's called Focus. Make up a story about somebody. Then just quote them. I have this friend who's a psychologist. He told me whenever I go up to someone, I should go up to him and say, I'm really glad to meet you. Isn't that interesting advice? I didn't say it. He said it, right? You can do that all day. You can try out all kinds of new behaviors. I have a friend, John. You know how he walks? He walks just like this. He walks like I wouldn't walk like that, but he would. Strange. <laughs> you can get away with anything doing that. Now, I wouldn't recommend stripping. You know, I met a woman who did this. <laughs> the cops will not accept that as a legitimate psychotherapeutic tool. They're going to say, my <laughs> Oh, there are a lot of ways of leveraging stuff. Rapport is one way of building leverage. It's a way of leveraging your interaction. It's a way of getting more of you in sync with the other person. <coughs> Going to their sensory language is a way of leveraging your impact. Learning how to political cross which is coming later, is another. All what, you've got to remember what technology is. Technology is, like I, I read this really neat quote by Arthur Clark. I like Arthur Clark. He's really a brilliant, brilliant man. Clark said, it has been said for centuries that man created tools. And this is true, but it would be far more accurate to say tools created man. Think about it. We create books, and the books create better people. We create computers, and computers create smarter people. And computers are just bicycles for your head. Amplifiers are just levers for your voice. And techniques of persuasion are just amplifiers for truth. These are all ways of leveraging ideas. Now, in the course of the next week, you will meet people who will say things to you. You people don't understand me. You don't understand my point of view. You don't understand my position. You don't understand my ideas. <coughs> Ask them questions like, how would I understand your position? Specifically, how should I go about understanding it? They go right to their dominant sensory language. And you go, oh, they're visual. I want to stay with visual explanations, right? Why? Because if you're talking French, the Frenchman understands you. If you talk Dutch, the Dutchman understands you. If you talk Spanish, even the Spaniards don't care. Spanish joke. <laughs> Let me do that in Spanish. Tu hablas espanol? Un poquito? Si? No hablo en español. No hablo en español. Okay. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to work on metaphors. Metaphors are probably, if I only have one technique, uh, persuading people by storytelling. You know that in the course of this I've told you lots of stories. And some of them might have been true. And all of them could have been true, and most of them are true. In some world, for somewhere, for someone. <laughs> most of them are actually were literally true, factually true. When they're not true, I'll tell you they're not true. I'll hold this hand up. That's a lie. The lie hand, this is the truth hand. Okay? So you won't mind if I tell the truth, right? <laughs> Time is lying. <laughs> now, what we're going to do is we're going to go into metaphors as a way of communicating ideas. And we all know that metaphors have been used since Esau, Jesus talked in tables. And we're going to go into why and how that's such an effective technique. And if you want to stop arguing, and you want to blow somebody away, you'll be able to give them a little anecdote, walk away in three or four weeks, they'll come back to you with their new idea. Which seems like a uh, oh, child of yours, maybe, from an illicit love affair with their mind. <laughs> That's all right. There aren't any. Uh, there isn't any child support with ideas. Now, what we're going to do is take a brief break. I can see right now, from looking at my watch, that it's my alarm set at 7:30. It's two o'clock. Let's take a uh, five-six minute stretch. Talk. Uh, if you want to try out some of the accessing cues, watch your friends. Keep in mind you're all being watched. This will ruin all your processing during the break. <laughs> <laughs> see you in about ten minutes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
ಇದೆ ಅಂದ್ರೆ
be prepared to be treated like one. This is early grammar. You know, this is humanistic grammar. <laughs> that's, that's only a slight exaggeration. Those of you who are, I, I know a lot of people who knew Graham back then when he was associated with Graham, and Graham had a lot of major contributions to philosophy, and the day of Graham was not one of them. Uh, he, had, uh, he had this ability to, he had this great theory of persuasion. Here it is, it goes like this. You're standing there, feed me truth. Here you go. Okay? Mm. I don't like that. Oh, oh. I like to chew my food before it goes down. That's the ram it down your throat theory of persuasion. Well, Brandon has moved out to California. He's been out there since 1969. He learned to say bitch in real slow. And he learned how to breathe. He's much more, he's much more tactile. He used to talk very visually, upper part of his chest. Now it goes like this. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to see you here this evening at the lecture by Nathaniel Brandon. That me. <laughs> I know what you're saying as you're sitting there. You're wondering why we might talk about understanding the rule of reason in your feelings, in your actions in the full context of your life as a human being. And now I would like to present the ideas brought to you by me. <laughs> <laughs> I always figured when he was involved with a woman, it was a three-way. <laughs> Him twice and her once. I tease, uh, I used to do these things all the time. I used to do Murray Rothbard. I know you met Murray, know Murray. Murray, I don't have to mimic. I just do point. <laughs> so all I do is copy him, and that's funny enough. There are a lot of very interesting people in the modern uh, freedom movement, and some of them are just very unique people. I used to collect gossip on them. I used to spread it like wild, didn't I? Right. I wouldn't stoop to that, but I had a friend who told me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, um, it's like the question, you know, Leonard Peacock wouldn't read the book on Rand by Barbara Brandon. <laughs> he says, as for me, I have not read the book and I did not intend to. And I, was, I, I set up a question for him. He lectures at it, what they call the Thomas Jefferson Institute, which is uh, an organization of objectivists out in California. And uh, the question would be like this. I, I told the person, I said, if you're going to go now, you're going to get thrown out, but it's a great question. I'll love you later. <laughs> they won't be fun your money either. So <laughs> don't leave the car. And I told him how to set up the question, the why, why Peacock would read the book. It goes like this. Dr. Peacock, you have read Immanuel Kant, cover to cover. And as Ayn Rand has pointed out, Immanuel Kant was the most evil man in Western civilization. You have read cover to cover Marx, so that you can understand the evil that he might inflict for his political views. And you have read from beginning to end B.F. Skinner. You have read from beginning to end all the Nazis when writing the ominous parallels, that we might better understand those who oppose the right, the good, the true. Based on this evidence, why do you refuse, specifically, to read cover to Barbara Brandon, your cousin's book, on Ayn Rand? And my friend says, well, setting up like that, you really painted him into a corner. I said, yeah, that's the idea. The reason you paint people in the corners is so they can't leave. <laughs> I said, is that supposed to persuade him? I said, no, literally, get your quick exit out the door. <laughs> uh, he wouldn't give it. He wanted to really see the whole uh, philosophy workshop. And uh, I wouldn't give it either. What's the point? You know, if you know I, I, my family is religious. I view it as a form of mental illness. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> they pray for me. <laughs> I think for them. <laughs> It's all division of labor. Um, it, I, I, I've got to tell you a, a, a brief aside on this. If you're wondering why I tell weird stories like that, and you go, what the hell does that have to do with persuasion? you got to remember something. Look, you're not getting out of life alive. <laughs> At the end of the conveyor belt, that's it. You're standing in line, and at some point you die. It's not something we look forward to. Those of us who are smart try and postpone it. While you're here, there's a lot of living to be done. There are a lot of friends to be befriended. 
a lot of lovers to be loved, a lot of things to learn, a lot of experiences to savor. Enjoy them. Revel in them. Have fun with them. Because life is for living. Life is for enjoying. And I've met too many people who go through life as grave as if they just stepped out of one. I met the kind of people, I remember a Christian once, who gave me this look and he said, I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. <laughs> <laughs> and and my, my reaction was, go tell some more people, I need more atheists. You know? <laughs> this is an example of you know, good Christianity. Boy, I, you know, I'm an example of a Christian. <laughs> oh, yeah. What are Jews like? <laughs> it's reasonable. The fact of the matter is this, and the reason I kind of have fun with this, and I hope you're having fun. Y'all having fun? No. Try it on. Yeah. 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 Give me an amen. No. <laughs> the, reason, the reason we're doing this is this. You are the first advocate of freedom most people will ever meet. You know, freedom is the ultimate heresy. It's the heresy that says, I have a right to think for myself. I have a right to live for myself. I have a right to share myself with people I love voluntarily. I have a right to care about things that matter in my life. And I have a right to understand and be understood. That's the ultimate heresy. You have a right to be free. And so does everybody else in it. You have a right to disagree. You have a right to disagree. You don't. <laughs> but everybody else, especially you, don't. I'm honored. I want you to remember, silence is gold. So do me a favor, go on the gold standard. Oh. So the way I figure it's this: if you're the first example of your viewpoint that most people are going to meet, what are they going to think based on meeting you? You know, if you go, you know, look, I don't want to be overly pushy, and I don't want you to think that we're aggressive here in my viewpoint. But do you think you could maybe take a little open-minded view? <laughs> <laughs> if you're overly aggressive like that, or if your idea of persuasion is the verbal equivalent of rape, <laughs> you're not going to communicate a lot of good ideas. And people are going to say, well, if that's an example of what you believe, I'll pass. How many of you at different times in your life have heard a viewpoint espoused by somebody that offended you and you didn't look into the viewpoint. Have you ever had that happen? I have. We all have. And it's a normal natural reaction as a human being, isn't it? Isn't it? Well, you've got an opportunity to make people go, I don't know what that person believes or what kind of chemicals he uses, but... <laughs> <laughs> wow, I want a little piece of that. That sounds real nice. It sounds interesting. All it does is get them curious. And that's part of why I get playful and have fun. So I hope you're enjoying it, and I, I want you to participate. You've got to remember that life is a participating sport. There are no conscientious objectors. <laughs> you cannot be a fan of the game of life. There are no stands. You're on the field with everybody else. And enjoy it. And that's all it's about. Let's talk about metaphors. If I only had one tool to communicate ideas. I would use metaphors. I love telling stories. And I don't use them because I love telling stories. I love tell telling stories because they work. And that reminds me of a story. <laughs> <laughs> In a book called Mind and Nature, Gregory Bateson makes a really good point. He tells about a man with the world's most highly developed and sophisticated computer. It is state of the art. He wants to know about mind. Not in nature, but in this computer. So he types in to the computer, do you compute that you will ever think like a human being? The machine set to work to analyze its own computational habits. Finally, the machine produced a conclusion on this display screen. There in glowing green letters were the words, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> Surely the computer was right. This is how people think. People reason with stories. When you want to communicate with a child, very often don't you tell them a story? 
one of the pastimes parents used to use, which is unfortunately neglected, is telling bedtime stories. I'm not talking Stephen King, I'm talking <laughs> Aesop's Fable. <laughs> there are wonderful ways to communicate love and caring and ideas. There's a book called Therapeutic Metaphors, which is on the reading list, and there's a story in there that I really like. A fellow named David Gordon tells the story. It goes like this. Long, long ago, in a special time, and in a particular place, a man sat before an intent assemblage of his contemporaries, and he told stories to them. Now, the audience had many diverse backgrounds. There were some that were very smart, and some that weren't quite as smart. Some were women, some were men. Some were well-educated, and some not so well. Some had learned their lessons the hard way, some the easy. Some had good fortune, and some bad. And all had interesting futures lying before them, though few suspected what the future really held. The storyteller, before these friends of his, began weaving his stories into his audience. He would tell adventures. Maybe it was a voyage, a magic lantern. Maybe a mysterious happening that required an explanation, or meeting with a magician or a maiden in the woods. He went on to tell us the story of a besieged city. Inside and outside the city were all the vast array of human emotions, the whole rainbow of human possibilities. We saw courage, and we saw vanity. We saw wisdom that people didn't even realize they possessed. And we saw folly in others and in ourselves. And inside and outside the city, we saw love and hate, and good and bad. Well, finally, the war ended. And there was one man on the Victoria side who leads his ship home after the war ends. Now, this man encounters many, many, many obstacles. Islands that tempt him to dash his boat upon the rocks, and others that don't. And one by one, as he overcomes the obstacles, and as he does, and as he learns, every obstacle he overcomes, his resourcefulness grows, his courage grows, and his abilities grow. Now, you may object. Sure, these adventures are exciting, and they're useful to our struggling wayfarer. But what use are they to us? And the storyteller smiles, and a kind of wry smile that only storytellers know, because they know the end of it. He says that he's discovered in his wanderings from city to city, village to village, and people just like us and them. That when he tells his tales, when he tells his stories, those who listen actually live these adventures inside of themselves. In fact, when he looks up for that look that sees clear through you, people are living amazing adventures all the time here. Now, metaphors. Metaphors are potent teaching tools. One key reason for this, one reason why metaphors work, is that the human mind doesn't just learn content. It doesn't just learn the facts. It doesn't just learn the statistics. It doesn't just learn the truth. What it learns is something more interesting. The mind is much too clever to be confused with just the facts. Have you ever notice when you argue a viewpoint, you can dump fact after fact after fact after fact after argument after argument after argument on someone? They rarely buckle from the weight. As a matter of fact, your mind sheds facts like a duck's back sheds water. 
You see, the mind, especially on the unconscious mind, <coughs> learns patterns of experience. It learns sequences of behavior. And this is why metaphors are so effective. <coughs> because metaphors provide new patterns to process the experience. Metaphors give us other ways to structure our understandings. And they're deceptively powerful. You see, an effective metaphor meets other people at their own experience of the world. It parallels the structure of the situation, but it has a logical solution. I'm going to tell you how to construct a metaphor that teaches people. But before I do, I'm reminded of a story. <laughs> I have a friend named John who mentioned to his wife that he wanted a birthday gift. Time was April. And he says, what I'd like is some summer gloves to go with his clothing. He was a salesman. He stood outside a lot. It's a person. And his wife forgot it. And he mentioned it a couple days before his birthday, and she forgot it again. And she got him something like dinner. Summer went on, and then fall hit. And it was getting near the end of fall, and she was out shopping one day, and she said, Ah, John wanted some summer gloves, and they're on sale now. So she bought him a pair. She took them home and left them on his bureau. It's had a nice little wrapping out of the pretty little wrappers. And he came home. And he opened the gift and she says to John, thinking of you. And he opens it and he sees the summer gloves. And he smiled and he put them on the next day when he went to work. But you know how it is just before the first snow? You know that touch in the air? And he came home and he took the gloves off and he laid them on the bed. And he said, you know, I really try to communicate with you. I really try to care. But our whole relationship is summer gloves. And that was his way, and this is a true story. That was his way of saying, too little, too late. Too little, too late. They worked out their problems. And from time to time, She'll try and make amends for some gross things she does. <laughs> and he does some gross things too, but he doesn't have brains enough to make amends. <laughs> <laughs> but every so often when she's trying to make amends, and it just didn't seem to come at the right time, he'd smile and say, honey, it's summer gloves, isn't it? <laughs> and they don't have to talk about it, do they? That's the purpose of a metaphor. That's the purpose of the story. That's the purpose of Aesop's fables. You don't have to tell the whole story to get the point across, do you? Ah, that's just sour grapes. Do you know the story? How many actually know the story? How many don't actually know the story? There was a story about a fox. And a fox was very hungry. And the fox decided, looking up, over a wall that there was a vineyard. And they had the most succulent, beautiful, you know that deep purple color the grapes get just before they're ready to burst or melt in your mouth? And this fox is so hungry that he tries to climb up the wall. It's a tall wall. And he leaps up. And you know dogs will try and jump over a wall and they don't have claws like cats and they'll fall back down. He tried it again and he tried it again and tried it again. Until so finally, tired out, Breathing heavy, panting the way dogs pant. They went walking off, muttering they were probably sour anyway. Isn't it amazing how when people can't get something they really want, that they think that it probably wasn't worth having anyway? It's a case of sour grapes. Now, when you want to communicate the same idea to people who've heard the same story, you can smile and say, it does seem a little like sour grapes, doesn't it? 
and they remember the whole story and live the adventure once again in their own mind. That's what teaching stories are all about. That's the reason that I think one story is worth 10,000 arguments. <coughs> because we reason by one little story. We don't reason. Figure it for a second. How many pieces of information would you have to process to fully consider all the facts on any one subject? <coughs> You've seen the stories about chess computers where they, where they try and compute all the possible moves? <coughs> It would take a, a computer that processes, I'm trying to remember, it's like it, it, it processes like a million bits of information a second. A second. It would take that computer one to the thousandth power years to fully compute all the possible moves on a chessboard. So putting it mildly to consider all the possible options and all the information is astronomically difficult. So what do we do? We do what the human mind is capable of doing. We find patterns. We find patterns that work. And metaphors are just other ways of building patterns. Now, when you're trying to communicate with a metaphor, here's what, here's what I like to do. There are several steps in it. And I'd like to write these down. Because storytelling, I like storytelling. Like my story of the giraffe last night. We don't talk about giraffes anymore, but we communicate more. <clears throat> and I do similar things with my friends. So sometimes my friends get even, they do the same thing to me. But we don't have a lot of arguments, but where do we know a lot of stories? <laughs> to, to build a really good metaphor, you need to take the following steps. Okay, the whole reason you're communicating by means of a metaphor is you see a problem, right? If you don't have a problem in communication, there's no reason to, to uh, argue or talk or discuss. What, what you want to do first is identify the problem completely. Maybe it's a problem like uh, poverty. Politically, that would be a problem. Or a problem like we don't talk enough to you. That could be a problem in a relationship, can't it? You need that time to grow up, to nurture it. First, you identify the problem completely. Secondly, you define the structural parts and the key characters. Like if you're having uh, problems communicating with a person, the key characters are you and the other person. The key parts might be, you complain about this, uh, my response is to defend myself, and your response is to defend yourself. Those might be the key elements. Because every, you ever notice how your fights follow little patterns? I mean, it's almost like script by, you know, it's, it's like you're reading. Ah, oh, I can see that you've done it again. Yes, I have, and I'm glad of it. But with my best friend, I couldn't do it with your worst friend. You wouldn't care. But it's like you're following the whole agenda. And you are. In fact, most fights are over the same thing. Those of you who have been married over five years, some of you have been married over five years. All right. Those of you who would like to be, who are also in the room, <coughs> listen to this. Do you find yourself, when you have complaints, and everybody has complaints, and I don't even know if they are until later, in which case I'll gossip. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that almost all of the difficulties you have are consistently over like two or three or four different things, and they're always the same things? Is that true? Is that true? All right. It's true in almost every relationship is that the key things that bug you about the other person are two or three or four different things, and they're usually the same thing. Now, I'm going to give you a way to resolve that. Now. You identify the problem completely, you define the structural parts and the key characters, and then you find an, oh, you like this word, isomorphic situation. Write that one now. That's not Panasonic, it's isomorphic. <laughs> isomorphic means one of similar structure or appearance. You know, uh, isomorphic uh, with a human being, a robot is isomorphic to a human skeleton. It's built like one. You can view a cloud as being isomorphic to uh, a cotton. All right, so you identify the problem, you define the structure, you found an iso a similar situation. It's going to have a similar structure appearance. And then you supply a logical solution to your particular problem. Like, for example, if your problem is that you're not communicating enough, maybe that needs to 
be solved by both of you listening more fully. You know, one of the best cures to yell at is listening. You want to blow somebody's mind who yells at you? Really listen at them intently. Totally sucks the wind out of their sails and they calm down and realize that you care. And they don't have to yell. You've amplified your listening, they don't have to amplify their voice. You supply a logical solution, then next, you couch the structure in a story that's either entertaining or disguises its intent. Sometimes you can even tell the story and say, I'm going to tell you a story that's designed to solve our problem. I like doing that. Because that makes it harder for me and i got to be even better. Sometimes I like that kind of a challenge and other times I like to be sneaky. Then what you do is you tell it congruently. Okay? Now, don't worry about those steps. We'll go over them and I'll show you how to put it together. Now, one really good way to learn how to do metaphors one really good way is to practice making up analogies. You know, life, life is like a river. There are times when you go over rough rocks and other times when the depth of the relationship keeps everything smooth and calm. And it may wind through life, going through different terrains, finally emptying into our final time together. It's an analogy, right? Maybe life isn't like a river. Maybe life is like a poker game. Maybe you get dealt different hands, and it's up to you how well to play. And it's up to you to either drop some cards and draw some, or maybe pull the whole hand. Maybe you have to ante up to take advantage, pull advantage of the opportunity in life future. Maybe there's sometimes for you to walk away from the game and go find another game. Maybe life is like a poker game. On the other hand, maybe the art of political persuasion is like cooking. Any of you guys, I know you wouldn't have cooked before, because I've never died from a woman's cooking. <laughs> Men, oh, you awful most of you. How many of you guys are, are fairly decent cooks? Okay. Good for you, good for you. How many of you are single or are pretty good cooks? Explain to you. Mary Lou, fuck it, I'm happy. What? Oh, yeah. Mary Lou wants to answer. Okay. You know, political persuasion is a lot like cooking. For those of you who have never followed a recipe, what happens if it says, first, separate the eggs? And you go, I don't feel like doing that. Screw it. Put the full egg in there. And it says, cook at 300 degrees, and you go, I don't want to do it at 300 degrees. I don't feel like it. I'll do it at 500. This says, leave in there 30 minutes. Stir occasionally, and you go, the Jetsons is on. <laughs> hey, if you're going to cook like that, what else are you going to watch? <laughs> Either that or the flip <laughs> Roger Ramjet, yeah. At the end of this, you take it out of the oven, you put it on the top. And you say, that son of a bitch, I'm going to give you a rotten recipe. It doesn't taste right. If you don't follow the recipe, it never turns out right. And if you put the flour in before the butter, when you're supposed to put it in after the butter, you get a totally different recipe. Isn't this true? If you want to effectively persuade, you have to put the right elements together in the right order in order to produce the result you want. Now, there are about a thousand, maybe billions of recipes for cooking, right? Just because one recipe is good doesn't mean other recipes aren't equally good, does it? Well, view me as a galloping gourmet, sharing my opportunity for you to stuff people's bodies with freedom. <laughs> Maybe that's an analogy that would work in persuasion. In fact, it's a legitimate analogy because if you don't put the elements of persuasion together correctly, it won't work. You know, it, it's, it's a lot like the guy who really screws up on dating takes a girl home into bed, the next morning tries to get her drunk. <laughs> this is, he got it out of order. It worked anyway. 
I know, but then the milkman had a good time, too. Oh, I'm sorry. That was nice. I'm really ashamed. And I never would have told a story like that. That was one that uh, Mark Emery told me earlier. A friend of yours. No, no, it was Mark Emery. No, no, no. Now, back to metaphors. Back to metaphors. All right. When you're supplying a logical solution, what you're really doing is you're taking a legitimate problem and you're finding a way of putting it in story form. And the story is a metaphor to the problem. It's not a literal example. It's just a new way of putting it together. When you put a logical solution there, it has to be one that the listener can initiate and sustain himself. If we're talking, if I use a metaphor to talk to you about poverty in Canada, and the solution I recommend is something that person can't do, what's he going to do about it? Nothing. He's going to go, that was the stupidest story I've ever heard in my life. Or he's going to go away, or it's going to be lost on him. But if it's something he can do, like don't vote for the kind of people who support those programs, then that person can accept that metaphor as a legitimate solution. Now, the metaphor should motivate action as well as provide the listener with a new understanding. You've got to get them to do something about it. That's the whole purpose. Now, you can choose the characters for a metaphor basically in any way you want. They can be just about anything. It really doesn't matter what they are. We can talk about if you're having problems in a relationship, the examples I could give could be uh, two sides of an arch having to give equal pressure to keep from falling over. It could be two horses on the same team, one pulling harder than the other. Those would be equally legitimate metaphors for a relationship. And I could go on, we could make example after example. As long as they preserve the basic structure, the basic relationship of the problem. Now, let me give you an example he gives, and then we'll go into how to use metaphors to persuade. Milton Erickson, who I mentioned to you earlier, is, was the world's premier authority on hypnosis. He was a master of stories. And there's a master of metaphors as ways of changing people's attitudes and changing their lives. He told a story about a man and a woman with sexual difficulties. Now, I don't want you to think that this story is about you. <laughs> this is about someone else here. <laughs> I like the story so much, I figure I might as well make use of it. You see, this husband and wife weren't getting along amicably. The husband liked to move immediately from arousal to pounce. Immediately to coupling. And often this left his wife pretty frustrated and unsatisfied. I know what some of you are thinking, yes, this is about me, <laughs> but those are the people next to you, not you. Anyway, this, is a, this husband and wife have discussed the problem, and like people do when they have a personal problems, they discuss the problem, they'd argued, they'd gone to a marital counselor, and finally they wound up with Milton Erickson, an old fellow who had overcome polio. He was a very, very wonderful counselor. Naturally, this problem reminded him of a story. You see, he had friends. And these friends of him were just wonderful people. And these wonderful people had an interesting situation. You see, his wife was a gourmet cook. She loved to prepare and serve these exquisite seven-course dinners. You ever had a nice seven-course dinner? Just wonderfully done. The table, beautiful. The candlelight, all the china looking beautiful. That was her way of expressing her love and her caring for her husband. She loved to do it for him and for her. But the guy was a meat and potatoes guy. He liked to dig right into the main course with no fanfare and leave the table. He liked his meals, but sometimes he got indigestion from eating too fast. And she felt like he didn't appreciate her cooking. So he went to an old and trusted friend, his family doctor. His doctor told him that to have good digestion and to really appreciate 
his wife's talents, he should slow down and savor each part of the meal, <laughs> casually enjoying all the delights that it offered. He should pay close attention to each of the different pleasures that each course gives, and then he finished the meal satisfied, knowing that he had had a fulfilling experience. Well, several weeks later, Dr. Erickson got a thank you note from this couple. Oh, and by the way, their dinners were better too. <laughs> You know, I really think that the story of Judas in the Bible was really mucked up. People didn't tell the story the way it really happened. If I ever told you the true story of Judas, <laughs> it's a true story. I have a friend who was offered a very, very high paying job. And offered a very high paying job. And he didn't know whether to take it because he didn't really want to come. <coughs> that money looked good. That money looked really good. It was triple what he was getting. He made it three times the amount of money he's getting now. Three times the amount. Is that zero? <laughs> You're worth every penny of it. <laughs> And I'll double that and stand by my position. <laughs> he asked me what I thought of him taking the job. And you know, you know how you can tell the mark of a true friend? A true friend is somebody who's really concerned about what's best for you. They don't always know what's best for you, but they're willing to stand by and help you find out. If they think that you're walking the wrong direction, they're going to tell you. You know a true friend? They're not going to go well, do your thing and have a nice drop. <laughs> So I told him the true story of Judas. You see, Judas was offered 30 pieces of silver in exchange for Jesus. Now he figured he could use that money to do good works, right? That was all the purpose. They were going to use it for the poor. After he finds out what the money really bought, after he discovers what he's really done, he throws the money away and he goes out and he hangs himself. Later, the tree dies. That was a bad bargain. This man was ready to make the Judas deal. He was willing to take 30 pieces of silver and give up what was really important, his care, his compassion, his passion for his work. Because work is a big part of your life in exchange for the 30 pieces of silver. What will it buy you if you hate your life? And then I smiled at my friend and said, now this may or may not apply to you. That's your decision, but I'm your friend no matter what. He made the decision to go into another area, an area he was happy with, and within six months, he was making more than he was offered for the Judas deal. Because when you do work you love, you get paid well for it. I thought that that was a nice metaphor. And I thought I did my friend a favor. And then I got offered the same deal <laughs> by the people I worked for. They offered me $8,000 a month to be a finance manager. 
Canadian figure that's about eleven thousand dollars a month income. That's a comfy income. <laughs> the only problem is that if people are paying you money to do something you don't like to do, what did you gain? What will money buy you that, that your loss of life? And when you go home, all right, you got all the money in the, the world around you, but you hate your job. What? How are you going to treat the people around you if you don't like your job? How are you going to treat your family when you get home from a job you hate? That's the Judas bargain. Story. Now, I know that there's some people here who are going to be offered that deal sooner or later. If you haven't been already, you will. You'll be offered it politically, you'll be offered it personally. Find what you love and find a way to make money at it. Find someone you love and find a way to make it work. Because okay ain't good enough. Great is what you deserve. I didn't even think the story would apply to me when I told it to a friend of mine. I just wanted what was best for him. Whatever he decided was, I was his friend. And he walked away from the dad and took what was right. I didn't argue with him. I didn't present the case. Don't you know that your friends are smart enough to figure the facts out for themselves and argue with themselves? Don't we all do it? And in the end, don't we go, God, I just can't make up my God, I can't mind. This is hard. Sure it is. If you're easy, psychiatrists should go home. <laughs> There's a story told that I like. And it's a story of uh, Jonah. And a story that used to be told by, who's a humanistic uh, scientist, the one who talked about human potential? Uh, uh, talked about hierarchy of needs. Maslow. Maslow. Maslow, thing. Uh, Abraham Maslow talked about what he called the Jonah problem. Now, if you remember the story of Jonah in the Bible, you, you, you had to these stories in Sunday school, didn't you? Yeah. If you don't remember the story, that's why I'm recounting the story, because otherwise they're going to go, that was a nice metaphor, what did it mean? <laughs> you know, it sure had a lot of personal meaning for me. <laughs> See, here's the deal. Jonah's minding his own business, and he gets called by a uh, God for demanding job. Jonah! Got a job for you! What is it? I want you to go preach to these people that if they don't clean up their act, I'm going to burn them to cinders. <laughs> You're the only person able to do it. Take a rain check. <laughs> now, Jonah's the only one who can do it. God says so, and you know God wasn't wrong. <laughs> But Jonah is afraid because he fears his abilities. Have you ever been given a responsibility that you're not sure you can do that's scary? You ever done that? Jonah was given the ultimate responsibility. You get to choose whether these people live or die, whether I snuff them out like a candle at night. Right? He's afraid, though. What if I can't do it? He has doubts. He has thoughts and second thoughts about his abilities. So he flees this calling. Everywhere he goes, misfortune dogs him. <laughs> He's on a bar. And the sea is casting it all over, and everybody's going, What the hell's going on? In the ocean. <laughs> this guy gets on board, and all of a sudden, it's Disneyland. <laughs> they find out what's going they go, uh, Can you swim? <laughs> Not well. We don't care. <laughs> Throw him overboard. Anyway, he, gets in, he ends up getting swallowed by a fish. Miserable, immobile. Stop. Three days there, he's in the belly of the beast. After three days of misery, depression, immobility, the fish throws him up. Which is different from eating at our home where you throw up the fish. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the beach, worn out, and he finally accepts his destiny. And he goes and he preaches. And they don't listen to him at God's house or not anyway. <laughs> but he had to go do it. Jonah, isn't Jonah a lot like us? In the way, you know, it's like Maslow said, he says, we don't fear our worst potential. We don't fear becoming like Hitler. We fear our best ones. Becoming like an Iran or a John Galt or a, uh, an Arturo Toscanini, a Michelangelo. 
the, an Edison, an Einstein. We're afraid of those. Those put fright into our soul. You want shivers up the back? Imagine yourself able to do that great dream that you've always had. Imagine yourself there. It's not just exhilarating, it's frightening. Because that's an awesome responsibility, succeeding all it is. We don't fear our worst possibilities, we fear our best ones. We flee greatness. What about those people who embrace their calling? What about people like Ayn Rand? How many of you have read Ludwig von Mises? Have you ever read it? The Economist? Tell you a story about von Mises. He escaped Nazi Europe. He was the dean of what they called in the Austrian school of economics, which was supplanted by uh, John Maynard Keynes. Because Keynes was compatible with fascism and Mises wasn't. As a matter of fact, there was a fascist edition with an introduction by Benito Mussolini of John Maynard King's book. It was printed in Italy. Mises gets out of Nazi Germany and he manages struggles to get to the United States. He gets to the United States during, I believe, the 30s and 40s, somewhere in, in around there. He doesn't speak English very well and he's in a financially precarious position. He was never respected by any major institution, no major university in the United States or in Canada. He was supported by financial gifts from admirers of his work. It was paid by financial angels. And he continued on. Never in his lifetime did he receive a Nobel Prize for some of his discoveries in economics. Never did he receive a full professorship at any university. Never was he invited to any economic conference, although he had laid the ground with his theory of money and credit, with human action, with socialism, which was a path-breaking, brilliant work. And he didn't believe greatness. He didn't fear the best in himself. Well, maybe he did, but he went on anyway. How about Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs? These guys go to their bosses and say, we've got a great idea. These people won't even lend the money to these guys. We're talking about $8,000 is all they want to borrow. <coughs> hey, we think we've got a good idea for a personal computer. You're nuts. No one will ever buy a personal computer. You're out of your mind. Get out of here. Neither one of their bosses will lend them money. They go to hell with it. In the garage, they put together fun sets of personal computers. Your dream? Microcomputer in every home? Their whole. Human mind amplified by the thousands and tens of thousands. They didn't run away from it. How about Akio Morita or Sony? That was the man who pushed cassette recorders into the marketplace, not to mention the Walkman. If it weren't for him, the United States would still be building those goddamn transistor <laughs> radios. It'd still be building TVs with these big damn tubes and transistors. It's true. Because he didn't think from destiny. Because you see, at some point after you're in the belly of the beast, and we're all there once with our careers, our lives, We've got to make a decision whether we flee our best potential or embrace it. Because I'll tell you what, embracing your potential as a communicator, as a business person, as a lover, as a friend, is like kissing God. I want to try something new. I told you two metaphors. One is Jonah and one is Judas. How many of you think a year from now you'll remember the Jonah metaphor? How many of you think a year from now you'll remember the Judas metaphor? 
And how many think you remember both? Now, my question is this. How many of you are going to be surprised when during the next two weeks you notice that these very problems about accepting money or your love of your career will come up? How many of you will be surprised when you realize that you have a choice to embrace your best potential or pass it up? Won't you be surprised during the next two weeks when you realize the choices are yours? That's the rule of metaphors. Did you notice how it got you to restructure your way of looking at some things? That's the whole purpose of a metaphor. That's the whole reason you use it. Now, have you ever marveled at the amazing power of Christianity? Dig this. It's got a guy, it's got 12 disciples, it's got a couple of fishermen, right? The kind of guys he hangs out with. Jesus hangs out with hookers, tax collectors, Right? The real slime of the earth. <laughs> well, not the hookers, but the tax collectors. <laughs> hookers at least give you something for your money. <laughs> now, he spent his time hanging out with the dreads, the misfits, right? Communicating what he considered a very important message. He's got 12 people around him. They're illiterate. They can't even read and write. He takes these 12 people and he turns it into the basis of a good part of European history and U.S. history. How many people fled from the old world to the new world to escape religious oppression? Think of the different groups. Name, name a group. Puritans, okay? Quakers? What was that one? Catholics, okay? Huguenots? Yeah, Jason the Huguenots. That was. I I'm sorry. What was the other one? Okay. A lot of people moved here to get away from the religious oppression and make a whole new world. Now, the question I got for you is this: With Christianity, what was it in Christianity? There were a whole bunch of competing religions going on at the time: Mithraism, Zoroastrianism. Judaism, we could go on down the line as to the number of different competing religious viewpoints there were in ancient Rome. How come Christianity hung on? I think one of the real reasons, let's get away from the religious reason, it was God's will. You know, boy, that's a great explanation. The church explains everything. <laughs> Why did the boulders hit the family of five? God's will. <laughs> you know what? You know, it's like when the plane goes down, they talk to the survivor. One survivor, and he says it was God and Bill that I survived. You know, God's up there saying, no, I just want to get the other 99. <laughs> I don't believe that. I don't believe that. One of the reasons Christianity survived is the metaphors and parables that Jesus talked in. They're metaphors and parables that were easy to communicate with people who weren't really that literate. Why? Because most people couldn't read or write throughout history. You gotta remember that historically the Catholic Church fought the printing press because they wanted to be the only one with the books. Because we know that the people who can read the books control the information. That's why it's so important to be literate. That's why it's so important to be able to read and write. Now, Jesus figured out that if we could tell these stories, and I could tell you a story, and you could preach to friends and tell the same story. Go through metaphor by metaphor, Christianity. Who can think of one metaphor? In a sense, how about what? Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan. That's one. Woman at the well. Woman at the well. Fish in the loaves. How's that? Fish in the loaves. Fish, fish in the loaves. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I thought you said vicious. And <laughs> 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 I mean, no, I, I, that was a joke. That's what I heard. I'm sorry. For you. What was the other one? How about the mustard seed? Do you have a taste of a mustard seed? Prodigal. Prodigal son. Okay. Camel in the eye of the needle. Camel in the eye of the needle. David and Goliath. Okay, they've been blind. There's a lot of stories. Yeah. Yeah. Widow and her tie. What? The widow and her tie. That's right. Okay. The bridegroom, story of the bridegroom. You know, you don't know when Christ is going to be. <coughs> What's that? Ah, that's right. Now, what, what happened was again and again and again, Jesus would keep referring to it, like he talked about Christianity called the problem of wineskins. You don't pour new wine into old wineskins because they burst. All right, now what was he talking about? He says, you're not going to take Christianity, the new wine, and pour it into the old form. 
the old Jewish uh, religion. It's a new religion. All right, that was a metaphor for his belief. Now, continually, they kept going back to parables, parables and stories. Why? Because a lot of people can't read and write. They don't have great memories. But you tell them a neat story, and they'll remember it for the rest of their life. How many of you have a friend who has one joke that he's told a million times? <laughs> Everybody does. Everybody, right? How do you have a favorite story? All right? We all do. It's normal. One of the reasons I'm convinced that Christianity has been so effective, have you ever... Have you ever watched the TV evangelist? Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Look, I look at this. Look, dig it. They start. They're really great. They start reading a sentence. And they never finish a sentence. <laughs> they never finish a sentence. They're always commenting. And Jesus said, go ye. Now, I didn't say go he. He didn't say go she. He didn't say go they. He said go thee. He said go ye. And speak the gospel. Now, he didn't say listen to the gospel. He didn't say read the gospel. He said speak the gospel. <laughs> 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 Have you been washed in the blood? No, have you been dry cleaned? <laughs> <laughs> look, hey, look, let me, let me tell you a story. If, if, if there are people who are religious, please. I, I do not mean to affront your beliefs. If you are irreligious, if you're irreligious, I don't mean to affront your, your non-beliefs. Let me express to you a line that I told my mother. I made a joke about God. She didn't like it. I said, God's got big shoulders, so understand. <laughs> I think he's got a sense of humor, too. She doubted when the person I knew laughed. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think one of the reasons one of the reasons that, that Christianity really got through really got through was because they had the stories. They had the metaphors as a way of illustrating basic truths for their religion, basic beliefs. That was their way of communicating ideas. You didn't have to know all of Christianity. All you had to do was know a few stories. You know, I know that if, if uh, someone mistreats me, I should turn the other cheek. That if they force me to go a mile, I should go another mile. That I don't return evil for evil. Tolstoy built the whole philosophy on that, that whole metaphor. The prodigal son. How many of you doesn't have a member of your family or a friend who has been a prodigal son? Isn't that true? Don't you all know someone who's done that? Gone out, so did wild oats, prayed for crop failure. <laughs> I don't know what you're complaining about. It's such a little baby. Uh, that's an old language joke. Um, but the fact of the matter is that Christianity really kept straight to the fact that you don't have to memorize all these lines of text. Just remember this one little story. Every week when most of the fundamental preachers preach, they use one story, one theme, one idea. And they stay with the metaphors. Why? Because it really sticks in here. It really works. Now, do this. If they are that effective presenting their doctrine, Christianity, Christianity is not what you call the penultimate rationality. It was not deduced from, you know, basic axioms. It wasn't really cogently argued until St. Thomas Aquinas got there and screwed up anyway. <laughs> if they were able to present a viewpoint like that, which doesn't have a solid basis of reason, then I think certainly if we utilize the tool of using parables and metaphors to communicate, that we can communicate more effectively politically. Does that make sense or not make sense to you? Wouldn't you like to be able to, in a sentence, say to somebody, I don't understand why you're opposed to prostitution, it seems to me. <laughs> Didn't have to finish it, did I? There are ways of communicating these ideas again and again. Metaphors are one of the most effective ways I can think of. Now, we are going to practice using metaphors to communicate. And we're going to spend a good chunk of this afternoon. As a matter of fact, it's like 322. After I give the following story, we're going to take a break, then we're going to get together, and we're going to work on metaphors for political problems. How to communicate 
free market solutions to that. Would you like to do that? Would that be valuable? Okay. Here's one that I've always liked, and I want you to remember something. Just because Michael gave you a story here doesn't mean you can't use it totally without credit in Canada. You know, I'm here as sort of a wet bat. <laughs> I'm doing sub-market labor. I'm not protected by, oh yes, and I'm damn glad. <laughs> I am not here at the request of the Canadian government. If I worry, you should worry. Ah, oh, they got something up their sleeve again. No, they don't. But there's a story I like to tell, and it's a metaphor that I use. See, one area that really disturbs me, two areas that scare the hell out of me. One is education. Education is the key to the future of the world. And by education, I don't just mean schools. You don't find education isn't buildings, it's not books. This isn't education. This is education. These aren't education, these books. Education goes on here, and here, and here. And with a mind that's got a question mark instead of an exclamation point, that's where education goes on. Education goes on every day. I've gotten more education on the streets than I ever got in school rooms, which is a shame. It says a lot about the educational system, about the school system. That's one area I want us to, to work on metaphors on, is education, because I think that's got to be the key, is to free up human minds. If you free human minds, everything else follows, right? It doesn't take too long for people to go, well, we've got free market in education, oh, what would you find to do next? <laughs> What? Free street. That sounds good to me. I could work with that. Now, one area that really concerns me, though, is welfare. Now, you find that most liberals argue that welfare is there for the good of the poor. And they're doing this to assist people in need. And most right-wingers are saying that bums are on welfare and they're basically cheaters. And they're left to their own devices. They're using their food stamps for Cadillacs, color TV stands. <laughs> no, isn't this, isn't this really, if I wanted to really parody the situation, aren't the liberals basically saying they're people, they're poor, they're hungry, they're needy? You can't let them starve. How can you let them starve? <laughs> yeah. How, you can't let them starve. You can't stand by and allow it to occur. And the conservatives are going, ha! Starving, huh? Let me tell you this story about this welfare mother getting paid, getting paid for being a brooding mare for welfare. <laughs> paid to just produce, just like a breeding cow. And uh, you know what they're using their money for? They're using it either for alcohol or soap operas or color TVs or cat -like. Or maybe Cadillacs with color TVs in them that have soap operas on them. <laughs> and they're using their food stamps. Who needs food stamps anyway? You can't mail a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. All right. These are, are if, if I had to exaggerate both sides, would you say that's an adequate exaggeration of both sides? Right? These are the compassionate, caring people. These people want the bums off welfare. I think they're both wrong. Not surprising. You know, they're both entitled to their own stupid, useless opinions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like your brother saying. <laughs> I like that. Tommy, I interviewed Tommy Smith in a comedy magazine. And he, he did this routine where, where he and Dick were up there playing a tune on the on the stage. Remember the Smothers Brothers, right? And they're up there playing a song, and then Tommy starts turning around and he's playing his, his guitar up against the uh, piano player. They're doing dueling banjos, you know, except he's doing it with the piano and doing it with the guitar. And Dick turns and he stops and he, he says, Whoa, wait a minute, I'm finally going, da, 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 da. coat off, and he's really getting into it, and the piano player's really getting into it. It goes, wait a minute, just a minute. You remember Mr. and Mrs. Sloan that came into our dressing room earlier this evening? They said they had been watching us since our beginning, the first time we ever came on the Johnny Carson show, first time we were on Jack Parr, the first time we were on Jack Benny. 
Do you remember they said they watched our show through year after year after year and they asked us to do one little favor for them, Tommy? One itsy bitsy little favor? Do you remember that little favor? They said they'd never heard us finish a song. <laughs> and they just asked us, could we please, on their 50th anniversary, do them a little bitty favor to finish a song? And you said you would. What do you have to say for yourself? And you know, Tommy looks down and says, that's cool. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> the whole audience is on the floor because he goes, Tommy, is that bad? <laughs> right? I, I was falling over laughing, but I didn't think this was terrible. And Dick said, <laughs> Dick shocked me. Why did, why would you say that? Piano players told me to say it. <laughs> the piano player told you to say it? He looks over the piano player. The piano player goes, yeah. Oh, you're doing it because the piano player told you to say it, right? Yeah. <coughs> piano player told you to go home. You go home. Looks over the piano player. Goes, he goes, yeah. Piano player tells you he wants to do another song, you're going to do another song, he goes, piano player goes, looks over and says, yeah. Says so piano player tells you to jump off a bridge, you're going to jump off a bridge. Not again. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're wondering what this has to do. People on welfare. I have no idea, <laughs> no idea, but it just seemed like such a good story, I didn't want to waste it. <laughs> that goes down to the, you know, behaving like people tell you to. And a lot of times we hear an opinion, I know people say you're either conservative or you're liberal, right? You, ever, you know people like that? You're either, uh, I, I, know, I know some people who are advocates of freedom, it's either you're a pig, thug, ludus, status, slime, or you're an advocate of freedom. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just a multiple choice like you get to choose. <laughs> what does pig, slime, thug, pig have in favor of it? Could you explain that? <laughs> you know, you, you get to be for everything wrong. Oh, I do. Boy, that's a prank. <laughs> One of the problems I think we've got with welfare is I really think it's been missed understood what welfare is really all about. And I have a theory about welfare, and uh, I want to share it with you. So it's a metaphor. It goes like this. You know, I've been reading about the ever-expanding drug use. You've been reading about that, about all these kids using crack, about, uh, you know, if, if they overdose, I guess their teacher's going to talk about, oh, teach you to make 30 cracks. <laughs> oh, they're turning on me. <laughs> It's okay, you weren't my friends much before, so <laughs> not really that big a chunk. <laughs> I've been reading about all these kids using drugs, adults using drugs. I've been seeing on 60 Minutes where parents and kids are going into co-detoxification. You know, where the parents are on this stuff, the kids are on this stuff, the whole family goes into, like, care unit. You have those, like, you know, hi, do you have lots of money and a drug problem? Come on in! <laughs> right? Well, there are a lot of people who really have that drug problem, and... The way it's characterized is this. I want you to figure out you got a young kid who's not really that worldly. And they've been told everything in the world's wrong. Don't touch yourself, you'll go blind. <laughs> Never let a boy see this, or you'll be sorry. You might be Miss February too, but you'll be sorry. <laughs> and you've been told don't do certain things. Well, so anyway, the way drugs work is like this you get an innocent young person. This person is offered some drugs for free, right? And this way it usually works the first time you ever tried marijuana. For those of you who tried marijuana, if you have it, maybe have a friend that told you to screw it up. She tried marijuana, she tried marijuana. They give you stuff like, hey, it won't kill you, just a pop. They do the same thing with cigarettes, but that's legal. All right, but marijuana, just take a pop, it's not gonna kill you. They take a pop and they don't die, right? Yeah. 
Just try it once. You're a chicken, are you? Come on, just try it once. Come on, all your friends have tried it. What's the matter with you? Man, the sun, heavy peer pressure. That's normal, isn't it normal? You know, you want to do something, don't they lay all this stuff on his kid? They do it with drugs. So anyway, a kid hears about it, he tries it, he doesn't die. Maybe a friend of his try it. Maybe they borrow some marijuana from his friend's mother's refrigerator at pop. <laughs> there are a lot of those women still around. Uh, Anyway, the kid starts using it regularly, you know, when it's available, because when you're a kid, I mean, how much money can a nine or ten year old kid scrape together? You know, 10,000, mom, I've been selling. <laughs> Highly unlikely. So what happens is he uses it regularly when it's available. And if you ask the kid, hey, you, you seem to be using a lot of grass, or you seem to be using a lot of coke, or you seem to be drinking a lot of booze, what's the kid going to tell you? Same thing an adult tells you. Hey, it's just temporary. I got some problems. I know none of you ever said that about work and about drinking, or about work and about drugs. It's just temporary. I'm not going to do this forever. This goes on. Every day he uses a little bit more, and suddenly he's hooked. He's chemically dependent. He can't imagine life without the booze, without the drug. Right? Isn't this the normal story presented of drug addiction? All right, now whether it's correct or incorrect, let's assume that it's correct for a minute. He can't imagine life without it, so what's he do? He rationalizes and he justifies. Tells you why it's okay, why it's right. So he becomes part of the drug culture. He chooses his friends and neighbors based on them. And his life revolves around getting drugs, using drugs, going to parties with drugs, sharing drugs, carrying drugs, avoiding getting caught with drugs putting drugs in his locker, hiding drugs in his locker, having her girlfriend carry it in her purse because she's going to be searched, taking it over to her friend's house because her friend's mom is gone. Right? This is all part of drug use. And finally, what happens is this person loses his independence, right? Because the drug runs and the drug says, I love you. You're mine. You can't do it alone. Well, me to die. Where the booze will say, What's it look like when you clear it? He loses his independence, the drug owns it. He loses his self-respect because he knows it does. How much respect can you have for yourself if you're kneeling before the great god marijuana, the great god cocaine, or the great god <coughs> And it snuffs out his ambition. I've seen a lot of lives ruined by drugs and alcohol. And a couple times in my life when I thought I was going to be one of them. It's a hard life. It is a hard life. And there's no friends like that. And you get one more waste of life. A human life, unrepeatable. So you get another human life wasted. Well, you know, we have an even worse problem than drug abuse. It's the problem of welfare junkies. You've got people out there who are pushing welfare. Welfare pushers. Hey, you're young. I know you had a baby. I know you want to support your baby, but hey, give your baby a break. Take a little money for it. It's all right. The government wants to help you. <coughs> it's not going to kill you. You think it's going to kill your kid? Have a little money for your kid? Try it. All your friends got it? What are you complaining about? It's okay. Hey, so little babe, you like it. You want to be around your baby? Man, we'll get you a little money too because it's important you be close to your baby. You're pregnant again? It's all right, we'll take care of your baby. How could you stand and let this baby go without? Why wouldn't you help? It's all right, it's all right. We'll take care of you. We know that this is just temporary. We know you're not going to stay in this position. I'm here to help you. I'll be by every week to help you. To help you. To help you. But I know it's temporary. Oh, your kids have had a problem? I'm sorry. Maybe it's a neighborhood room. Maybe if we moved into some government housing, 
we could really help you, you know. That way you could give your kids a chance. You want to give your kids a chance? What would it hurt to have a little help for the kids? Here, take a little more. It won't hurt you. Look, all your friends are doing it, aren't they? All your friends get a little help from the government. It's just a little taste. Someone's going to get it. But ain't your kids going to be someone else's kids? Take a little, take a little, take a little. I know you've been on welfare for a while. I know you've been taking assistance. It's hard to get back in the job market, isn't it? I think that maybe we ought to put together a job program for people like you. We'll get you in the program for two, three years, get you ready for getting back in the job market. We'll pay you $150 a week tax free. How much do you have to earn to take home $150 tax free? 220? 230? Hey, now out of the 230, what do you got to pay for? Clothes? New clothes? Got to pay for something to watch the kids? Right? Now, how much do you need to get away from the house? 290, 300, 310? Don't worry. It's all right. You have a right to this. You have a right to have decent housing for your children, decent housing for yourself. But you're hooked. You're a hook. And that's welfare pusher. What's going to happen to this welfare pusher? If somebody's going to say you're sucking these people in, they're going to say, what a humanitarian I am. What a wonderful thing I've done for this human being. What a comforting thought it is to know that our less strong are protected. But I've turned this person into a welfare junkie. I own that person. How can you respect yourself when you know I'm going to come by every week and look in your house and make sure you don't have any food in the fridge? Spin in that food stamp on it. Make sure you don't have a man living with you. Because you know men cause more of those babies that I can give you extra money for. <laughs> and of course, if you don't treat your kid the way I think you ought to, maybe we'll take the kids away from you. And then of course, maybe you need psychological help. I'll bring somebody by to talk to you. They really care about you. You lose your independence, you lose your self-respect, you lose your ambition. You've become part of the welfare culture. I'm the pusher. If I'm getting you on the welfare, how many of you believe that a welfare worker has paid extra money to get people back in the job market? <laughs> how many of you believe that if I get people and say, good news, I have no caseload, every one of my people are working, the boss is going to say, damn fine job. Wish we had more like you. He's going to go, we're going to have to take budget cuts. I'll have to move you to another department. <coughs> Why can't you go find some more people who need the help? She's going to be out knocking on doors. <laughs> Hi, need a little, do uh, you need help? Just try a little. Just try a little. Try a little. It won't hurt you. You won't lose your self-respect. And what have I done? I've been pushing you into welfare. I've been sucking you in just the same way those drug pushers have. And when it's all over, what happens? The welfare owns you just like the drug owns the junkie. Where's your self-esteem? Where's your independence? Where's your autonomy? Where's your dignity? How much dignity can you have when you live at someone else's choice? When they can cut you off without a penny? How much respect can your parents have for you, your children have for you, without looking up to you. It's awful hard to look up to a father or sister who drinks beer all day and doesn't work. It's awful hard to have respect for a mother who doesn't work. And it's awful hard to learn good work habits when your parents don't work, isn't it? That's yeah. what happens to your kids. They learn that it's respectable to be on welfare. They learn that it's respectable to be dependent. They are victims. They've been con. They've been lied to. They've been defrauded. They've had their dignity stolen from them. They've had their autonomy stolen from them. They have had welfare pushed into them, into their veins, just as much as a heroin pusher did it to a junkie. Now, I have a question for you. Does that metaphor give you a new way of looking at welfare? That's the way I literally look at welfare. I came on that idea one day and I started looking at the victims. The real victims are the people on the welfare. They really are. They've been totally con. They've been totally con. Now, it hurts me because it takes money out of my wallet, it takes money out of your wallet. But you got your dignity. 
You got your family. You got people who look up to you, rightfully so. What have they got? Nothing. Nothing. Unfortunately, no. Did you? Okay. No. One of the problems about communicating ideas is showing people new ways of looking at. If you can show somebody that metaphor, they're going to have to take a good look and find that the real problem is finding a way to get these people into the job market, not onto the dole. Into self-respect and out of dependence. That's when you got to come up with a solution. It's important being able to come up with a solution. But I want you to realize that that metaphor that I gave you, which you're welcome to use, may enable you to have conservatives and liberals take another look at it. Another look at the problem instead of looking at it through their own eyes. Share them your metaphor and allow them to restructure their experience. You know what will happen? It won't be an argument anymore. Just say, give me three minutes to give you my metaphor. And think about it. And they'll go home and they'll think about it and it'll change their lives. Not always. But I'll tell you, just as you're sitting here, I can see in your eyes that you're going to walk out of here later today. You're going to smile and in the course of the next couple weeks, welfare as an issue is going to come up. You're going to have this urge to argue. You're going to have this urge to prove. You're going to have this urge to be right. You're going to have this urge to be inflexible, to open their mouth and ram your ideas down their throat. And then you're going to walk out and you're going to say, this metaphor would be really nice. And you're going to see this little picture of welfare junkies come up inside your desk. And you're going to hear the sounds of children saying, but where's dad? Why shouldn't I get a job? And you're going to share that with them. And they're going to look at it through your eyes. It's a way of communicating that argument. And it's a way of bypassing normal objections. And objections aren't bad. I want you to remember one thing about objections. Whenever someone objects to what you're saying, they're saying to you, I need more information to base a new opinion on. I need more information to make a new decision. If they didn't care, they wouldn't object, would they? Let's take a break and then we'll work on some metaphors for schools and some other stuff, okay? All right. You know, it's a spiritual equivalent of lynching. <laughs> you can write that down. It's obvious. <laughs> okay, here's what, um, yeah, I had in my briefcase some. We've got sort of a choice, and the choice is um, how you want to do this. What I'd like to do is this. I've got a whole bunch more material than I thought I was going to have. And I know that's going to bother you, getting more than your money's worth. <laughs> I, and I'm a firm believer in giving more than your money's worth. I'll tell you why. If you give people more than they ask for in value, if you give people more value than they pay for, they'll bust their backs getting even. Right? Isn't that true in business? You, get it, you go to a good movie, don't you recommend it to your friends? You take good care of somebody, don't they feel just really good toward you? You serve your customers well, don't they recommend you? Don't they do repeat business with you? Mm -hmm. It makes sense as a way of doing business. I did end up with more content than I thought I was going to. Here's what I'd like to do. I was going to stay entirely with techniques today. And then tomorrow morning, do politics, and tomorrow afternoon, do public speaking. Here's what I'd like to do if it's okay with you. 
and I'll leave it entirely up to the group here. Everybody else is irrelevant in the world. Is Mark here? <laughs> yeah, I'm totally right. Everybody listening here is irrelevant. Some are just noisier. <laughs> now, and, and that's not true. Mark is uh, Mark is one of my favorite people. I like Mark, and uh, I don't mean that as a setup for a joke. Later. <laughs> Wait, what? That's going to be nice. Uh, yeah, that's more fun. Man, because I can't humiliate him, you know, publicly in person. Oh, yeah. If I could do it publicly in person, it would be a totally different ballgame. What I'd like to do is this. I would like to carry some of the technology that I intended to include today, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow afternoon, I'd like to work on public speaking. And anybody who wants to work on politics and political campaigns, I will do a free seminar Monday night or Tuesday night. Does that sound fair? Is that an enough value? Is that agree? And I will, matter of fact, I'll film the seminar if this is all right. If we can do that, we can either film it or record it. So those of you who can't attend Monday or Tuesday night can still get it. Would that be valuable enough? Yeah. I'd like to do that so that we can stay on the technology over the weekend. If that, is that agreeable? Is that, do you like it? Yeah. Do anybody want to lynch me for it? <coughs> that, that does one more comment about you in the men's room. And that's <laughs> if your mother knew. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I should tell everybody. You probably didn't know this about her. She's been keeping a low profile. It's called ducking, right? She's been keeping a low profile, and there's been a good reason for it. You've been reading about drug abuse. Uh -huh. And you've wondered why. You've wondered who. She knows and won't tell. <laughs> it's up to you entirely whether you bring the subject up to her later, what her connection is with the drug culture, what remarks, if any, she's made in drug encouragement, and whether or not she's ever been associated with known drug users. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> she knows anything about it either. But if she did know something about it, wouldn't you want to know? <laughs> Vegetarian. That's absolutely vegetarian. I have friends who are that. That's a really good church, the vegetarians and the Presbyterians. Bugs <laughs> <laughs> Bunny is religion, right? Academy. 
uh, in 1976, I was with the Libertarian Party. I've been very active in the U.S. Libertarian movement and had uh, written articles, had done speeches, and so on. 1976, I ran for Congress against Morris Udall. Morris Udall was the man who appointed me to the Air Force Academy. <laughs> it was my way of saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, this is a secret for even my close Canadian friends. I was that close to beating him. 47, 48% more, and <laughs> I whipped his ass. <laughs> just this close, just a heartbeat away from it. And I didn't make it. During the course of that campaign, I tried out and I tested techniques of persuasion, some of which I used in the old workshops and some of which I discarded because they weren't as effective as I wanted. It's a wonderful opportunity to practice for free because they had a Republican running, and Republicans are like, you remember in the Bible when they talked about the publicans being the bad guys? The Republicans are sort of like recycled publicans. <laughs> and then they had Democrat, and everybody knew Moore Shudal was going to just win the election, hands down. Everybody knew the Republican was there because they needed some sacrificial lamb. <laughs> and this fool believed that he was never going to help him. Yeah, go ahead, Larry, we'll help you. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, lead the troops. I know there are five million Indians. Hey, we're behind you. Wrong way. All right, the, the media knew that there was no chance the Republican was going to beat him. The Republican didn't know the media knew, and he believed he could beat him. The Democrat knew there was no way he was going to get beat. Ain't no way he'd more shit off. So when I ran for office, I knew that I stood no chance of winning. That takes an enormous pressure off you, right? You know, <laughs> somebody says, you think you're going to win? No way anybody's going to beat more shit off in this district. Well, then why are you running? That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Anybody who knows me knows that whenever I set somebody up like that for media, my next shot is to sort of my way of setting them up for a one-two combination. That enabled me to communicate my ideas. Is The whole reason I got involved in politics is because of the war in Vietnam, because of the growing... Uh, American government, because it became very clear to me that I wanted to look forward to someday when government would allow people to be free, when it would protect their rights, not violate them. And it's not just selfish, it's not just for me, because I figure at some point I'm going to die and these schmucks can't take any more than I leave them. If they want to recycle my chemicals from my body, I guess they could. <laughs> but if you want to leave a mark in your life, if you want to do something really significant, you could write a great book that would influence generations. Or you could change a whole society in a way that would enable Da Vinci's and Michelangelo's and Einstein's to flourish. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to do? To make it possible for the best and brightest to grow easily and not be crushed. Not be crushed by the system. Not be damned so that they can't fully express themselves. And I see a lot of that potential. You see it in children all the time, you see it in adults. And you say to yourself, I don't want another war, I don't want another destruction of these people like ever. That was the reason I got interested in political persuasion, is I really think that we have the best product in the world. It's called freedom. We have the best product in the world. And we can't give it away. You want to try a fun experiment during lunch hour tomorrow? I will guarantee you it's likely to get you arrested if there's a cop. <laughs> fun experiment. <laughs> no, no, it's perfectly legal. Go into your wallet, take a 20 out. Walk out in the street, go up to the first well-dressed person and say, I want you to take this 20, this particular 20, please take it. Guy will <laughs> and walk around you. You could walk around the whole block and say to them, this is a perfectly legal 20. It's a good 20. I want you to take it. It's valuable. Would you take this for me, please, sir? They won't take it. <laughs> so I said a normal person. <laughs> Put it in one for me. <laughs> 
I don't see squirrel in the for the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> I look your window around here and there just a feel a certain degree of self-esteem, a delusion because you have no esteem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, they all believe it though. Uh, <laughs> fact of the matter is, the reason you can't give it away, and, and they've done experiments like this with psychology, I didn't make this up. The reason you can't give away the twenty dollar bill is people are gonna cook with debt. <laughs> what debt? When you talk utopian, if I were the average person, you'd say, what are you for? We're for freedom and peace. We're for a highly advanced civilization that respects everyone. Well, who's against that? Right? I mean, who's going to say, well, as for me, I'm for misery and poverty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the opposition. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> the reason you can't give it away is it sounds too good to be true. It looks too good, doesn't it? Oh no, this is too good to be true. What did your parents tell you something looks too good to be true? Oh, there's a catch. <coughs> yeah, I know I get to be free, but what's the catch? You get to be responsible. Yeah, I know, but what's the catch? I mean, where's the price? You get to raise your own children. Oh, no, come on, come on, come on. What's the bad part? Oh, the bad part is you don't get a lot of government. Oh, shit, I want it some. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that we're not communicating these ideas well. And it's our fault. Right? The meaning of your communication is the response you get. If what you're doing doesn't convince the person, change what you're doing. It's not their fault, it's yours, because you are the independent variable. If they aren't understanding your ideas, change the way you present them. Change your formula. Change the format. Change it to a metaphor. Mirror their movement. Pace their representational system. Get into their sensory ideas. Politically cross dress it. Keep doing stuff until something works. If you were a business person, you ran an ad for the finest business in the world. You ran full page ads in McLean. You even, yay, oh yay, stooped to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> full pagers, flyers door to door. You open the door, nobody shows. Well, if you're the average person, you go, Damn public, they're too stupid to understand what fine products I'm offering. And if they don't want it, to hell with them. And you keep running the same ad until your business went into the ground. That is the difference between advocates of freedom and business people. Business people, if their ad doesn't draw, do something very unusual. They change the ad. Now, I know this sounds radical to you. <laughs> I know. It's a whole new idea. The fact of the matter is the reason we're not bringing people around our viewpoint is we haven't been changing the ad enough. We haven't found out what works. We haven't been willing to use all the different techniques that are available to us and all the different approaches. And one of the reasons why people aren't saying to us, where have you been? And they ought to be saying, where have you been? Shouldn't they? Can you think of anything more wonderful to give somebody that an opportunity to live their life just the way they want? An opportunity to grow free and strong and good? Can you think of anything better to give your children as a heritage? Or your parents as a going away gift? <laughs> They're going to go away sooner or later. Wouldn't it be nice for them to know that they've left something really wonderful? I'm going to leave someday. I hope I leave something really wonderful. That's a wonderful thing to leave. Because if we do it right, if we communicate these ideas as well as we can, and you will, and I will, as we practice this, people are going to say to you, oh, all my life, with open arms, I've waited for you and your message. Where have you been? Now, sometimes you won't get the same response that I get. I get a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> I find it a little embarrassing. <clears throat> But when you're communicating your ideas well, that's just back when people got with open arms. There's no resistance when you communicate well. You know how you know when you when you make a sale perfectly in your business? Is when they say, okay, I'll take it. With no argument. It means that you set up the whole steps properly. There's no resistance when you present your ideas well, given that person. In my business, they call it a lay down. Oh, that was a lay down. They just came in, they were ready to buy. I got a definition of an easy sale when you do everything right. 
I've got a definition of an easy persuasion when you do everything well. And I've got a definition of communicating effectively. Because when you go through the steps in such a way the person goes, I never thought of it that way. I like that. And you won't have people say that. And that's why we're going to do a couple more metaphors. Now, you've got your steps of the metaphors. Go back in your notes. Who can remember the steps? What are the steps of the metaphors? Step one. Define the problem. Define the problem, okay? Step two. Step one. Define the structural part. Okay? And the key play. Okay. Structural parts and the key characters. Then you find what? Okay. Then what do you do? Find a logical solution. And then? Yeah, you put it together in a story that's entertaining. Okay? That's a pretty simple thing to do. Let's take a few problems that confront Canada today. If you had to pick one problem, I think education would be a problem that I would occur to me. Is there, is there any problem more on people's minds? Do you think that? Oh, yeah? Federal debt. Government. Government debt. Government debt. Okay. You got a government debt. Okay, let's 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 walk through this one. You got a government debt, right? That's the problem. Okay, ideally what do they want the state of affairs to be? <coughs> Balance budget. Is that right? Okay. All right. That's our problem. <coughs> government deficit. What are the key elements in the problem? Okay. Let's think it out. Spending. Spending. Spending more than you bring in? Well, no, you can view it as under taxing. That's the way government views it. <laughs> you can balance the budget. There are two ways of doing it. Cutting the spending or increasing the uh, taking. Right? Robin Hood could have had a national debt. He could have borrowed money from the villagers. Sure could. Okay? All right? So what you got is a, is a difference between what they're taking in and what they're spending. All right? Who are the key characters in the spending? Politicians. Bureaucracy. Okay? And also the population who wants free goods. Very good. And the people who pay the bill. The people who are getting the goodies and the people who are paying for the goodies. Right? You know, I, I always view it as, as government is sort of like being Robin Hood with overhead, you know. <laughs> Take from the rich, give to the poor, cut off 15% for my man. Nobody's poorer than us. Right? That's right. So we're getting poorer, Robin, better take 25. Now, well, there's, another, there's another group, and that is the ones who, while they don't need the money themselves, feel that the other people should have it. Okay. Yeah. The people who are concerned that the goodies get to the right people, yeah. or in their opinion, the right people, okay? Now, let's see if we can't put together a metaphor. All right, here's what I want you to do. Now, remember I told you a nice way of putting together metaphors, play the analogy game. It's the way I like to do it. All right, the government debt is like a, I want you to pick out anything at random. Some of you think might fit. A perpetual mortgage. Okay, government debt is like a perpetual mortgage. <coughs> okay, how would it be like a perpetual mortgage? Let's give some elements of a mortgage that would be similar to the government debt. You borrow money. All right, you borrow money. Are you paying interest on that? On the, the debt? Yeah. yeah. A good chunk of your debt. The interest is like a U.S. debt. You know, they okay. they like we've got a national debt. Why is it in bonds? <laughs> Excuse me? Isn't that part of the national debt if I buy it? Shut up. <laughs> now, all right, it might be like a perpetual mortgage where you're paying interest on it. How else might a, a mortgage be like the national debt? We're all living in the same house that we've for years in the mortgage. All right, it's all living in the same house where we've years in the mortgage. How about the roof falling in? <laughs> yeah, right? Basement. No money for repairs. The basement's flooded. No money for repairs. Yeah. No money for repairs. Or improvements. Or improvements. Okay. And we're slated for urban renewal. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a, that was a, no, no. Um, all right. 
That's one way of looking at it. All right? Mark that down, yeah? Um, it would be like a, a rock pile. That each generation adds another rock to the pile of the debt, which, when it gets large enough, will come crashing down on the next generation. All right? That's a way of looking at it. All right? It's like a rock pile. Now, how else is it like a rock pile? How else might the national debt be like a rock pile? Who would want to pile the rocks up? Rock All right. You know, there are going to be guys using the rocks, right? Uh, I, I know the guys with the gravel pit. They need a place to put the rocks. People will sell the rocks, right? The guys who are stone. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just bolder than most. <laughs> yeah, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. You know what they say about honey? What? I guess that means you're from Colorado. From Boulder in the You thought it couldn't get worse, didn't you? <laughs> wait, wait, it's better. All right, let's, let's, all right, let's try another one. What was the other one? Cancer. All right, national debt is like a cancer. How is it like a cancer? It multiplies. All right, it multiplies. You get, if, if it's not cut back, it's... Keeps going. Only the professionals who think they know how to cure it and don't really. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, okay, hey, if, you're, if you're following most of the stuff that our National Cancer Institute in the USA have, and I'll bet yours, what they're into is treatment of cancer after you get it, because that's what yeah. bread is. Preventing it, they go, oh, we don't want to prevent it, because that's a growth industry. Hey, really? Hey, think about it. Look. March of Dimes. Do you remember the March of Dimes? When you were kids, in the USA, they said March of Dimes. We all brought our little dimes in. President Roosevelt had polio. We were going to end polio. Right? They get the safe and back vaccine, right? They get the polio prevention stuff, right? We abolish, we prevent polio. I mean, you're talking about an extensive standard, right? So the March of Dimes say, well, we've done our job, we'll go home. No, they found four new diseases that they thought would be incurable and kept rolling right on. That's a true story. Yeah, well, if they do as well as that, as we pull them out, a couple of dimes, right? Cancer is carrying on. It uses up your health and resources and makes you less able to cope with the rest of the world. Nice, that, very nice. Uses up your healthy resources. All right, how else might it be like a cancer? Well, Oh yeah, everybody's a therapist, right? Like everybody's a doctor. Some productive, right? The national debt. I mean, who profits from the national debt ought to be a good question to ask. They certainly do. The people who lend the money are picking up interest. That's true. That's gospel. Everybody says they want to cure it, but nobody really does. Uh, how about this? The national debt is like a life support system on a brain dead patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, you did. That. I like that. Like, as soon as you gave it to me, okay. Let's call the cancer. How about uh, the cure could be worse than the disease? That's possible. Have you ever met cancer patients where the cure yes. was almost worse than the disease? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What else? How else might it be like cancer? Put the rest of the family Wrong. in the position of having to support you. Yeah. Ah, that's a nice addition. Okay. How else might it be like cancer? Long-term pain for short-term gain. Uh, oh, that's right. Possibly. Okay. What? I saw a hand back here. I saw a hand over here. Oh, no. That wasn't a hand? That was a hand. That was a hand. That was a hand. Oh. So? That man bought it for $4 million. Sneeze in a gallery on a pig. Uh, all right. How, what else is the national debt like? The further from business. How is that? Because uh, they spend more money than they make, so eventually they they run themselves. So that there's nothing left inside the store. Everything's gone. They haven't got anything to replenish the stock. I'll tell you what. See, a lot of people know that they're in businesses like that might be a good metaphor. See, all of these are decent metaphors. I'm just I'm trying to. What we're doing is analogy building. That's how you build metaphors. It's it's like this. All right, it's like a poorly run business. What happens when you put together a fully run business? You keep hoping somehow you'll build a market. You ever done that? You go, maybe tomorrow they'll come in. Maybe if I can just stretch a little further, then I'll make that sale. Maybe if I could borrow the money from Uncle Harry to just make it through the month, then we could 
get back on our feet and move into the black. You ever done that? Has anybody ever run their own business had that happen? I've had that happen. You know, you can live a long way on hope. How else might it be like a poorly run business? You don't change uh, <clears throat> to correct what's wrong. Right, that's it. Rather than changing the business, the way the business is running, you just keep borrowing money. Okay. All right, what else might the national debt be like? Let's pick another analogy. Another analogy. Farmers feel getting overgrown the weeds. Mm-hmm. Farmers feel? feed a larger and larger family. Okay. Well, might be like overgrazing. Too many sheep on a field? Mm-hmm. Uh, what else might it be like? Natural debt, what else might it be like? Yes. Like a river with a dam broken. River with a dam broken. Okay, follow that. Okay, a flood. The water rises, you know, just a little bit of a time. Okay. Like All right. So nice analogy. That might work. Oh yeah, like a badly like to get that one further. It's like a badly designed dam above a town. It it works fine, but the water gets higher and higher. Yeah. And sooner or later, it's going to burst and flood the town. Yeah. That's a nice. The United States knows a lot about that. <laughs> Well, I, I view it as sort of our contribution to surfing. <laughs> you know, the, the, the real nice thing about these, anybody who's got questions about the government's ability to run anything sensibly, every time they see one of these dams, they go, who put that on? We did? The government did? Yeah. Are they still around? You know, companies are always gone, right? That's crazy. Let's let's pick one of the metaphors. But yeah, one more. Okay. Okay. The national debt is like a giant dragon. Okay. Okay. The government is the other people who look after tend the dragon. Then there's the uh, the villagers who everything they grow goes to feed the dragon because the dragon's breath will keep a few people warm. That's very good. I'm wrestling with the other ones because I'm trying to fit in how we can get special interest groups into this because there's got to be someone profiting by it. Yeah. Like someone who thinks they're profiting by it. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like it's, it's like Nazi Germany using Dachau to warm homes. Mm-hmm. Cool. That's good. I, that was really a launch, not deliberately so. I, I don't, don't, please don't use that. But, <laughs> but it's, the, the, the system isn't too much different. You know, you, again, metaphor is the object here is to draw parallels. But that might be a way. Yes. The ads that the uh, people who are benefiting, the minorities are benefiting, and the talent, dragon fighters. Okay. You need a cause. Well, right? hey, the minority that might, uh, let's go back to the cancer analogy. Would you, which one would you like to play with? Does anybody got, you got particulars out of the analogy you heard? We've got no particulars. We got like the end of the river. Let's try the let's try the dam. Okay, we've got a rising river. That could be the rising national debt. Who are the players? The people who built the dam. Those would be one. In the wrong place. Yeah. Right, because they always built it in the wrong place. If they built it in the right place, it wouldn't be a problem, right? And they're getting electricity. Some people are getting electricity from it, and if you let the water out of the dam, they won't have any electro- They won't have as much electrical power. Possibility. A small town getting the, the electricity from a dam that's flooding other people's land. Yeah. But they're selling a lot of that electricity to the United States. <laughs> 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 This is what's called current events. <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> well, the thing is, you have people who are above the dam with a beautiful lake, and people who go over the dam don't have a flood in it. Good point. Let's, all right, let's try this analogy. Now, let's turn this into a metaphor for the national debt. Let's say you're discussing, let's say you're discussing the national debt with somebody. National debt is something that's esoteric, right? The national debt. You can't touch it, kick it, hit it, because it's divided all up among all these different banks and different lending institutions. 
and people who owe money to these people. It's hard for you to visualize, isn't it? National debt. But anybody can visualize a dam. Let's try that as a metaphor. <coughs> All right, we've got the problem with the debt, and we've got the problem now with flooding. And the water is rising, which means the flooding is rising. Now, who's profiting from that? The people using the electricity. TVA in the USA. TVA, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, they put the dams up, flooded everybody's farm out. Right? The water was rising, they're saying, how come, uh, Ma, you notice the river's real high? Yeah, it's going to keep going up for about the next five years. <laughs> it is? Yeah, we got to move it. We'll be under about 30 feet of it. Why? They need electricity. Oh, so you can move? Yeah. That's where your, your flooding works. So the flooding is occurring to the people with the water backing up in the dam. But you need the dam to get the electricity to the fuel. So you're flooding out all these villages. These are the people paying the price. <coughs> Okay, we've got that. Now, what would be a logical solution? We want to break it right away. Because well, then you've got flooding of everybody yeah, beneath the dam. Open it more. All right, you need to, you need to drain it out. All right. Wouldn't that be a reasonable solution? Mm -hmm. So that you don't have the flooding up there. Now, of course, and I want you to keep in mind something. that If you've got a dam as a metaphor, you're <coughs> supposing that it's a good idea to capture at least some water. Rather than knock the dam down. Yeah, you had a question. No, I'm just going to play them and let the beavers build their own dam. <laughs> 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 it's in a big beaver joke, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Canadian spent like that. That's as soon as that, as they say in the Great White North. Um, let me. All right, a couple of. Everybody here during the day has, has heard different metaphors. Let's try that as a metaphor. Who thinks they'd like to present that as a way of communicating the national debt problem? Who'd like to give it a try? Okay. And I want, want you to remember that there's 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 no failure, there's only uh, miscommunication. Who'd like to give a shot at that as a metaphor? Who thinks they could do okay? And we'll even give you applause. Huh? Who'd like to give it a try? Mary Lou would like to give it a try. Actually, that, this was the thing that was going out when we were Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I used to date a girl like that in high school, you know. <laughs> you know, I won't go out with you, you know, I'm still home. Not people. Mary Lou's good people. Does any, would, it, would anybody <laughs> like her? <laughs> what? Mary Lou. Stand up and apologize to the class. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> Okay, who would like to use that metaphor as a way to communicate? Who would like to try it out? Yeah. Your friends will love you. Your neighbors will respect you. Your fellow advocates of freedom will humiliate you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody like to try it? We, no? we sort of left out one step, which is what solution are we trying to push? <laughs> what was the solution that, that we thought was the right step? Drain the dam on the flow. Drain, the drain the dam. You don't, you don't want to. If you're going to use the dam metaphor, <coughs> no pun intended. <laughs> if you're going to use that as a metaphor, you have to keep in mind that that your metaphor will control your solution. You got to keep in mind that with cancer, you could say cut the cancer out. With the dam, you say, well, what we need to do is lower the water level. We need to drain the dam, and then deconstruct the dam because it shouldn't be there in the first place. Take it down and put it where it ought to be. So in private debt. There's about, there's about three ways to do it. Increase taxes, cut spending, or uh, print money. Or inflation, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, well what we're talking about right here is that, yeah, you're, you're correct, that would be also a way of balancing the national debt. So we counterfeiting. So we, <laughs> which, what, what we're recommending when we're talking about draining the dam is we're talking about reducing spending, aren't we? Right? We're not talking about adding more water, because that would be the revenue. We're not talking about printing up more, because that would be melting icebergs or something like that. Or calling, you know, rainmakers. <laughs> sure, all of a sudden it comes down. <laughs> Let them out again. What we're talking about is letting the water out. Because usually, isn't that the better way to balance the budget? Is to lower the spending. That's what you want to do, too. It gets, you know, government is like DDT in the food supply. 
Once it gets into the food chain, it doesn't get out. Once it gets into the economy, it tries not to get out. Let's try that as a metaphor. Mary Lou, would you like to give a shot?
U Haul had been earning a profit, didn't ask for anybody's protection, anybody's support. They had developed their own market. So, what the government did is they subsidized a competitor, U Haul. With U Haul money. With U Haul money. Yeah. What? <laughs> that was really dumb. Man, that's fair. That's just called free competition. <laughs> The handicap system is like golf. What's your handicap? Oh, 15 billion. Okay, start off. Using a metaphor like this is a wonderful way. Just try it and try the conversation. You know, the national debt's a lot like, and then just go right into the analogy and say, you know, like a national debt, what you've got to do is you've got to release the water, let the people beneath the dam know that you're cutting off their electricity, that they have no right to get their electricity at the expense of flooding other people's farms. And that there are safe, economical, sensible ways of getting electricity without ruining other people's lives and livelihoods and fortunes. Doesn't that make sense? As a matter of fact, I'll use that later in another workshop sometime. Okay. Actually, I'm not, I'm not doing the weekend workshops anymore. They're too demanding. They really are. I have no idea what a dream. I know what you're saying. You think it's boring for you, Michael. What about us? <laughs> <laughs> ah, that was cool. Okay. Let's try with schools. Let's try with schools. Let's talk about what education is like. All right, let's talk analogies. First, let's talk from the perspective of key characters in the schools. What's the problem in public schools? What are the basic problems? Here's some idea. What are the basic problems in government-run public schools? Lack of discipline. Lack of discipline. No, it turns out I'm literally. Okay, they're not educating. They're not, they're not educating. Okay, that's one problem. What's another problem? Stifles creativity. That's another one. What'd be another one? They're like Over. factories. They're trying to turn out buttons that all over the thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the next one. That's, it. that's another way of looking at it. Okay. We talked about the students. What about the teachers? Let's talk about the teachers. Who are the players? You got the kids who are players, the yeah. teachers are players, the taxpayers are players. And the school board. What about teachers? All right, what, what's it, what it, let's look at them for a couple of minutes. What? What? They can't have the size class they want. They can't be demonstrative towards the children for encouragement. They don't get nailed to special abuse. Or, they can't have verbal abuse in the classroom. They can't have verbal abuse in the classroom. They can't have verbal abuse yeah. They should learn my post techniques. Now, I never say anything to you, kid, but my old teacher used to say, You motherfucker, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going to say that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, what else? Well, what else? Well, what else? Well, what else? I'm sorry, I, that was really in poor taste. And I, please, I apologize, but I just wanted to dramatize the point now. I'll myself. So. Uh, hey, no more 12 letter words. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't going to be selling money they have to. I think the last uh, interest is that they will be the children. Eh? Okay, there are strikes and, uh, you know, like, complex from different areas. Okay, there are a lot of teachers are being forced into unions they don't want. All of them. 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 That's even more than some. <laughs> some, 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 are, some, some do want the unions. I find the people who usually want the unions are generally incompetent teachers. Well, think about it on an assembly line. I, the people I find in my business, for example, in different businesses, the people I find that are good at their jobs get overpaid. Now, think about it a second. People in my line of work who do a good job get overpaid. Now, we never view it as being overpaid. We view it as being underpaid. Because no matter how much I get paid, it's not enough. <laughs> That's what I put down. Income per year, not enough. It's a very good thing. Sam can't tax it at the same rate. <laughs> now the way I got to figure is this: What does it do to the best teachers when you put them all under the same set of rules? It's like when they get out, they lose. There's no, okay. there's no some some go in industry. You no know way. All right. How about innovation in education? How much innovation is allowed? Except for the board decides yeah. nothing. Could you? Does, I, yeah. It depends how much uh, you want to deviate from what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Like you can do what you're supposed to do, and then you can do what you're not supposed to do. And then you fulfill the guidelines. Okay. So you need to bust the rules and get the job done or follow the rules and fail. No. Okay. You can follow the rules and get that part done, and then you don't have to follow the rules because you 
Play the game, right? Yeah. You play the game and then you add to it. Okay. What do schools do to parents related to their children? Antagonism. How? How would that create antagonism? And how does it create it? Yeah. I mean, what, where's the antagonism well, coming from? School says we're going to teach them this way, and they're trying to say, no, we want them taught genetics, not the books they have. We want them to read. I, I have a question for you. <coughs> Here's, this will ruin your whole day. I know you've all heard about phonetics. Mm -hmm. Try and spell the word phonetic, phonetically. <laughs> <laughs> There's a paradox there. You can't do it. They didn't take themselves very seriously. No. All right. You have, mm -hmm. you have disagreements over uh, the way you want your children educated. What else does it do to parents? They use uh, the schools as a drop-off place for the kids. It's almost like a free babysitting. Could view it as a free babysitting. Some parents do. Don't call me at work. I don't care if Johnny knifes somebody. I'm busy. How about it takes responsibility off the shoulders of parents for making decisions about their children's future? Yeah. No, it, really? it doubles the responsibility. Other people are right. jamming garbage into the kids' heads, and the parents have to work twice as hard to get it back out again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but it's so how about that? Parents who care, the parents who really care, have got double problems because they got to take the garbage out and put in what they want, with, which might be other garbage or good stuff. We don't know. It depends on the parents. It's different garbage. Yeah, different garbage. You got to recycle garbage. Now, for parents who don't care, it makes them irresponsible. They say, "I'm not going to worry about it." Everyone will take care of my kids' education. You learn it a lot of times. Educated and it didn't do anything. That'd be yeah. excuse a lot of parents. I Mom, I talked to you. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> that always ruins her day. There was a hand up here. So I handled it for her. She covered it. She covered it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it didn't do that much to me. Yeah. See, so, you know, that's the argument I heard from a lot of drug users in the 60s. <laughs> drug use. <laughs> it didn't hurt me any. <laughs> you ever you know, notice how people who are saying I don't have any good cigarettes are coughing when they tell you that? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, all right, that, now we've got teachers, we've got parents, we've got kids. You have a bureaucracy. Too. You have a bureaucracy. Oh, yeah. How about the ones that aren't parents that are paying anyway? Yes. Oh, yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. People who aren't parents uh, who are paying for other people's kids. That's a way of subsidizing uh, having lots of kids. Yeah. Ah, steamed by the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> or in my state, Mormons. <laughs> Which is even worse. You know, they're like they're like Mooney without the uh, intelligent look in the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, look, I'll tell you one thing. Look, we live right next door to Utah. Let me tell you something. They did a lot of nuclear testing there. <laughs> if it weren't for the Mormon Church, I couldn't support nuclear testing in Utah. <laughs> you know, so I, I want you to know that it changed my mind. Yeah. Uh, it also something that also does is uh, it destroys the nuclear family because the parents, it's the parents' responsibility to bring up their children and to educate their children and teach their children how to learn. All right. That's the thing that school doesn't do. It, it shoves, shoves destroys family relationships. relationships. It shatters family integrity. Okay. It, 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 re right. it replaces education with school in with con consumption of facts. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, now we've got some of the problems here. Okay. We could, based on the different different examples we've given, the different people impacted. I'll bet we could build a hundred different metaphors on schools. I'm not going to ask you to, so you can go, are you ready? <laughs> okay, that's good. You're doing real good. Okay, you got breath. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you my gorilla joke later. The gorilla joke? Uh, later. later. Yeah. <laughs> you remember it. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good joke. Pretend something real funny happened and laugh. <laughs> That's good. Um, okay, let's figure now, in terms of schools, who do we want to focus on for the purpose of the metaphor? Which of the aggrieved parties? Children? Teachers? Children. The family? It depends who you're talking to. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's more here than meets the eye. 
But it's the children who are most affected because they're the ones who are, who are in those schools. Okay, let's talk about the kids now. All right, let's talk about the kids. Okay, let's presume the kids aren't getting educated might be the element we'll talk about. All right, what kind of metaphor? Kids not getting educated in school is like what? They're not getting enough sleep at night. Okay, how would it be not like like not getting enough sleep at night? Uh, like, oh, it's just the bad of your health. Okay, I heard poor nutrition as an analogy. You know, you know what it's like? It's like kids not getting educated right is like a junk food diet. It, it'll keep you barely alive. It didn't hurt me none. But later in life, it shows up as heart disease, as arteriosclerosis, as cancer of the mind. Cancer of the mind. Okay. Um, what else might it be like? Children not getting educated is like not turning on the lights. Not turning on the lights. I like that. Legal you know, what, you know it's like it's like these little little switches. You know, that turn sideways. Yeah. Barely turn up the lights, and the schools are telling, "Hi, this is a hundred watts." Yeah. I'm turning on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Plug-in drive. Okay, what else is it like? What else is children not getting educated in school like? How about, might it be like? How about letting a fire just burn out slowly? Mm-hmm. Letting a fire, letting a candle <coughs> burn out slowly. <coughs> <coughs> not the other candle. Okay. Where the candle is the, the, the child's tree. How about a bonsai tree? Any you ever see a bonsai tree? I like it. I like it. Those, no, those weren't the trees that attract, attack Pearl Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what else is it like? Those were zero trees? No. Oh, okay. I've never understood that. How would you call in a report 16 zero planes came out? Which one? 16 and zero. I never understood that. Now, let's look at the bonsai tree as an example. You know, what they are is, is they dwarf this tree. That's an oak tree. What they do is they trim the roots at the bottom and they trim the uh, branches at the top. And they take it out of the ground like twice a year, I think it is, ceremonial. I'm, I believe it was twice a year. I'd, I'd be corrected on that. And as a consequence, it never grows any larger. looks wonderful. looks exactly the way that the gardener wants it to look. But it can never grow up to be a strong able to protect folks from the wind. That might be an analogy. What else might not getting an education in school be like? Yeah. Being jailed before they commit the crime. <laughs> Being jailed before they commit the crime. What else might it be like? A drug. A drug. How? On a drug, you don't provide enough water for crops. As a result, of crops are malnourished and don't grow properly. Okay. Public education is like teaching children to unlearn. How about this? Somebody mentioned nutrition. How about this? The government-run schools are like malnutrition. You know, malnutrition never killed anybody. Never did. What it did is it weakened your body to the point where you died of something else. With malnutrition, you're more vulnerable to disease. With malnutrition, you can't live a full, happy life. With malnutrition, you don't have an opportunity to stand up fully tall and express your full potential. You never know what it's like. And you never know what it's like. And you might be one malnourished person to another saying, I've been malnourished and didn't miss much. This is normal. This is normal. When in fact, what normalcy is, we rarely see it. That might be a nice metaphor. I just, you know, with that nutrition. Malnutrition might be the perfect. Or, you know, well, the perfect is one useful. All right? What's the solution to malnutrition? How do you cure malnutrition? Somebody should challenge what I just said. You don't cure malnutrition, you prevent it. Because in the long run, if you damage a body, you know, a body has enormous healing powers. But the greatest cure for the human body and the human mind is preventing injury from ever occurring, preventing damage. You're not going to cure cancer. I don't think we'll ever find a cure for cancer. I think what we'll find is a prevention for it. They may be able to treat certain kinds, but I think ultimately the cure for heart disease is preventing it. 
the cure for polio was preventing. The cure for malnutrition is good nutrition at home and on. And the cure is going to be what? Parents spending time with their children when they're young, teaching them the values of learning and questioning and asking. And holding that question mark up like a banner. And taking them into school and giving them that. Yes. Yes, but we've just gone through an era where we said parents must not decide for children what they shall do. They should not let them uh, go to school and, and make up their own lives. And be let them teachers them. Uh, for them. You know, you know that's that's, <coughs> that's a very good that's a very good point, and you should have brought that up. Thank you. The point that she's brought up is, is exactly right. Here's the issue. The issue isn't whether or not children are going to make up their minds or going to be influenced by other people. They are. That's part of being a child. The question is, who's going to get the influence? A loving family <coughs> or strangers in a classroom? I would have done loving family. You're right. Very good. Very, you know, that's a good point. That could happen. But 90% of the time, I'd say that if the family realized it was their responsibility to raise the children, would be a little more love. Yes, please. A child's mind is like a white piece. You don't write on someone who else. Um, oh, I like you. Is that a You can dump it in there with any garbage you find. You're hungry, eat whatever's on the floor. It's all good for you. Sure, sir. I know the dog did that. Eat it, go ahead, it's good for you. <laughs> would you do that to your child's body? Of course not. Well, why would you do that to your child's mind? Why would you say, learn whatever anybody tells you to, try what anybody tells you to. Whatever they dump into your head from the TV set, eat it, believe it. Don't exercise your mind. Don't stretch those muscles, someone else will do your thinking for you. The TV will. The teacher will. What we need to do is we need to take our children and we need to teach them good educational nutrition. We need to teach them that it's important to question. We need to teach our children to read, not in school, but before school. We need to teach them to, to learn to read and write. That the kids are ready at 3, 4, and 5. And those of you that have children know how smart your kids are. And if you don't, yeah, you're not feeling proud enough with your kids. <laughs> because they were. You wouldn't take your child and give him good nutrition, and then at the age of six say, for the rest of your life, you get McDonald's, Wendy's, the Colonel, you get Taco Bell, Del Taco, you get Swanson TV dinners. This will be your diet. And by the way, you've got Olympic competition when you turn 18. <laughs> don't exercise in between either you wouldn't do that to your children's bodies but we do it to their minds because we don't want to find out what they need to learn we don't want to find out the principles of education we don't want to learn how to build strong minds. Like to do that, we 